Your attention, please. May we turn your attention to the commissioner's box near the Orioles' dugout for tonight's ceremonial first pitch. The man is familiar to all baseball fans. He holds nearly every Baltimore lifetime hitting record and won 16 gold gloves. Number five, Brooks Robinson. Brooksy delivering the ceremonial first pitch to Doug Desense, who succeeded him at third base. And yes, he does have a coat with him. <laughs> the field, gratuitously saying, I think, is uh, playable. It's soggy. Here's the starting lineup for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and it's interesting to note that the leadoff man, Omar Moreno, has run off 18 consecutive stolen bases. We'll see what happens first time he's on. Now the defense for the Baltimore Orioles taking the field. It is a night where you need a hand warmer. You've got to keep moving. You've got to keep wiggling around as John Lowenstein goes into the left field position and he's going to be working in one of the soggy areas of the outfield though the turf actually is quite firm. Al Bumbry in center field. Bumbry one of the real flyers defensively in the game of baseball over in right field. He's a horse for this ball club. Big Ken Singleton moving to the inner defense for Baltimore. There's Doug DeSensei who caught the ceremonial first pitch. Been outstanding in his career here. And of course, this man will go down in Baltimore baseball history as one of the greatest ever at shortstop Mark Belanger. At second base, Earl Weaver going with the percentages puts in the left handed hitting or the right handed hitting uh, Billy Smith in place of left hander Rich Dower. Eddie Murray is over at first base. This is another horse in this ball club. He really is a good one. He plays every day and never is heard from. Behind the plate, Rick Dempsey, you heard in the pregame program, Howard suggests that he may be one of the best catchers in all of baseball. And out on the mound, the young left-hander from New Hampshire, Mike Flanagan, who was 23-9 and nine on the regular season. He won a ball game in the playoff series against the California Angels. He's very steady, and he's become an outstanding pitcher. The umpires for the ball game tonight, Jerry Newdecker out of the American League is back at the plate. Bob Engel of the National League at first. Rutz Getz of the American League at second. Terry Tata, National League at third. Down the left field line, Jim McKean, American League, and Paul Runge is down the right field line from the National League. The dimensions for this ballpark is relatively short down the lines as you can see at 309 feet there is a lot of room out in center at 405 and those are the distances up the alleys. They do play on natural grass here and they have played some five football games already and they'll have another one scheduled for this coming Sunday. So we'll see what it's like when we come back here. The prognosis for the weather is more bad weather coming in as of Friday. Omar Marino, the numbers on the year for him in the championship series for the National League title, he was three for 12 and he stole one base. Out on the mound, the left-hander Mike Flanagan because of the bad weather last night, he went out and threw easy for five minutes when the game was officially called. Jim Palmer out with him through for a while himself. So here's the first pitch of the 1979 World Series. And it's fouled away. Our key, I think one of the big thing right now is that you've got to try and as I said before neutralize this left handed power of the Pirates and it's going to be up to the left handers Flanagan and of course Scott McGregor to do just that. You got to keep this guy off the base. He's like Bumbry. He'll make things happen. The pitch bounces outside and it, it'll go back into the bag or be no nope, they keep it in play. Rick Dempsey back of the plate will be tested. I am sure early by Moreno because they want to know how they can handle it. Dempsey on the other hand says Chuck Tanner's baseball teams in his career have only stolen one base off of him. And Flanagan comes high and tight to Moreno and the count goes now to two and one. You can keep the ball in on Moreno. You keep it in with hard stuff and he'll, he likes the ball out over the plate. He likes to spray the ball around if he possibly can. You the defense for Baltimore. You see Bumbry a little bit in left center field. It is now three and one and Flanagan trying to keep that ball in on him. He doesn't like to get that ball out to where he can get the big head of the bat on it. He's got excellent speed and you don't play him too deep. He doesn't have a lot of power on the year. Well he hit eight home runs. 
Desense on the edge of the grass at third, three and one pitch. It's beat on the ground to the right side for Billy Smith, the second baseman. There's your first out. But you can see how quick that Marino gets down that line. He a made a choice. Yep. But the key task to keep him off the bases, and Flanagan was equal to it. Tim Foley, Chuck Tanner says, is the man that brought it all together for his ball club. He was the last piece in the puzzle for them. Four for 12 against Cincinnati in the National League Championship Series, and Flanagan comes inside for ball one. You see Frank Robinson may be the most active of all big league coaches, positioning his outfielders. We have turned the outfield over to him. Flanagan hits the corner to make it one and one. Last year, and Jim Palmer was very forthright about it, the Baltimore outfielders were a sorry lot defensively. Pull the string on the change, and he gets him out in front. He fouls it away to make it one and two, and the change is a pitch that Mike Flanagan picked up from Scott McGregor in the middle of the season, and it's made a tremendous difference in the way he's been working on the mound. That ball is popped up out into left field, drifting toward Lowenstein. John makes the catch, still two out. Fastball's being clocked on the first two batters, Don, at 91 and 92 miles per hour. He's sneaky fast. He's got a good fastball, and he keeps it away from the right-hand hitters and into the left-handers. It will tail and sink for him. He keeps a hard slider curveball in on him to keep him off balance, and then he's come up with that good change, which makes it That's a little what more made him. That's Winning right. 19 a year ago, 23 this year, he studied Scott McGregor, who is known for his pitching guile and who has the great change up and very quickly Flanagan duplicated McGregor. Let's see what he can do with Dave Parker. Parker hits a bullet down the right field side. It's going to the corner for a base hit and the big guy pumping for second stumbling as he goes around first base. But he's all right. He reaches back and grabs the back of his right leg. Now right there the first test gentlemen for Mike Flanagan against the Bucks left hand power much has been made of left hand to stopping as you look at it in replay the Bucks left hand power well on the season Dave Parker for instance who can hit anybody hit 13 home runs against southpaws and 12 against right handers Stodgill when he's hitting can hit anybody. And that's exactly the truth, Howard. And of course, the big thing right now, Tony Bonnerone is going to go out. I don't know whether it was Parker might have pulled a hamstring or something as he went around that bag at first. You pointed it out, Keith, that he did stumble going around the bag. He tried to get the fastball in on him, and I believe Parker just looking fastball all the way. If you're a hitter, you'll go up there at times and watch the way that pitcher will try and work right off the bat to your opposing uh, hitters or actually your own teammates. And of course, these guys aren't dumb. They know their own strengths and they own they own their own weaknesses. And of course, when you know that you're scouted as much as these two clubs have been scouted, you got to figure that somewhere along the line they are going to try and hit a point of weakness. Bill Robinson is at the plate, 262 hitter, 0 for 3 in the playoff series. And Flanagan's fastball comes in for strike one. Flanagan during the last season and a half has improved his move on the mound. He has become very proficient at holding base runners. He picked off eight this past season. That's fouled away. He's in front two as he pulled the string. He has developed confidence in that change and he throws it a lot. That's really made him a good pitcher. You know since June 8th of this year Flanagan finished the season 17 wins and five losses and well, if you're going to finish strong that's the way to finish it. Well, that's the key point. That's when he started using that changeup, developing confidence in it, because he said he had been throwing the fastball and the curve exclusively in the early going, and he hadn't been winning the way his talent would have dictated. With two out, and Parker at second base. Swing foul tip, he stays alive on a one-two count. The coaches, Joe Lonette at third, Al Monchak at first. The outfield is straight away and well back. There is no wind, thank goodness. <laughs> it would really be rough if the wind was blowing. Struck him out. So the top half of the first inning is over. Pittsburgh leaves Dave Parker standing at second base 
And Flanagan strikes out Robinson. So after one half inning of play, Pittsburgh nothing, Baltimore coming to bat. Game one, 1979 World Series. The batting order for the Baltimore Orioles, Bumbrey, Belanger, Singleton, Murray, Lowenstein, DeSensei, Smith, Dempsey, Flanagan, Smith, and Lowenstein representing percentage baseball to get the left-handers in the lineup against the right-handed pitcher. The defense for Pittsburgh, Robinson, Moreno, Parker in the outfield, Madlock, Foley, Garner, Stargell on the inside, Nicosia back of the plate, Bruce Keeson is on the mound. And the most impressive thing to me in Bruce Keeson's professional baseball record with the Pittsburgh Pirates in his career he's 27 and 7 in the months of September and October. It's astonishing isn't it you talk to him about it he said I don't know why but somehow my stuff seems to work better in the cold weather. I'm not arguing with it anymore I'm just accepting it. <laughs> He's going to find out tonight because it is chilly here. I think one of the big keys to watch tonight is how many times that a pitcher will be allowed to go up. It's very cold. And a lot of times the umpire will allow them to just go up and blow on their hand a little bit. They have given them permission to do that tonight. And I would have to think that it's proper because it is chilly. What would you say it was 41 degrees and it is going down rapidly. That was an hour ago. I suspect it's cooler <laughs> than that now. So here's Bumbrey. Al at 285, 4 for 16 against the Angels. He strokes at the left field. It's going to drop for a base hit. And it drops and rolls rather well. So the outfield turf is firm. Well, there's the same kind of guy. They come out of the same chapter, Moreno and Bumbrey. And you got to try and keep both of those guys off the bases. Moreno with 77 stolen bases on the year. But Al Bumbrey had 37 of his own. Weaver, as you look at this hit again, Bumbrey going right with the pitch, dropping it into short left center field for the single. Weaver likes to run Bumbrey immediately when Belanger bats second because Mark is a good hit and run man despite the hapless batting average, and he makes decent contact. He'll get into a point where he'll move him, as you say, hard on the hit and run, or sometimes even in the first inning, by, or whenever Bumbrey's on and Belanger comes up, they go to the sacrifice. Keeson's first pitch is low for ball one. And of course, Weaver is a good manager in this point. You see Belanger checking with Cal Ripken, his third base coach. When Weaver gets ahead on the count, all of a sudden that's when he will start to make things happen. And now, this is what the pitchers are going to have to watch out for tonight. It is still wet over by their dugout. The infield has been covered as you look at Earl Weaver. But they pick up that mud in their spikes, walking back and forth to the mound, and they got to make sure that they are clean before every pitch. Bumbrey coming off first. And the pitch is high and tight to Belanger, who has a sore lower left leg. In September, he had a foul ball, which broke a blood vessel. Before the championship series, they lanced the leg, drained it. During the playoffs, he wore that shin guard, and he is still wearing it. But what a magician he is out there defensively. My goodness. Keeson misses just inside. And the count now, three balls and no strikes. And let's see what Earl Weaver decides to do. Funny thing about Keeson, he's gone through a spell of first inning troubles as you look at Chuck Tanner. Shortly after the All Star break, that began in his last 13 starts. He's allowed 17 runs in the first inning. He walked in. They play the first two games of the series here, then they move to Pittsburgh, and Willie Stargell, who is the unquestioned leader of this ball club, goes to the mound with a confident word. For the 29-year-old right-hander, born and raised in Pasco, Washington, now living in Turtle Creek, Pennsylvania, became quite famous after the 1971 series when he left the ballpark instantly by helicopter to fly to Pittsburgh to get married. He also became a national sports personality by pitching six and a third innings in the fourth game to beat Baltimore. Kenny Singleton is at the plate now. He was six for 16 in the championship series. The and he represents power. He got to the winning very late, Keith, but his wife waited. <laughs> and the pitch is low inside. Now, Keeson, in contrast to Flanagan, who went out and threw yesterday, Harvey Haddox, the Bucks pitching coach, said Keeson did not throw either last night or earlier today. 
Question is, is he loose? He's struggling right now, but he hammers home a fastball strike to Kenny Singleton to make it one and one. I would say the big thing that that off day might have given uh, Keeson is just taking away some of the sharpness, some of the fineness that he wants to have when you're going into a World Series. You don't want to be wild. But he throws a lot of double play balls. Don, we worked the Bucks pennant clinching game not so long ago. It was a week ago Sunday, and Keeson threw it, and he was in trouble in the early innings, and every time got out of it with a double play ball. Singleton fouls it back into the crowd, and there's the first souvenir. Well, he got out of trouble in four of the first five innings, that's for sure. And the four double that, plays. That's right. And the thing that you're trying to do right here to Kenny Singleton, Singleton's got good power. Because what he does, he says, I use this whole ballpark. It's 309 feet down both lines, and it drops out pretty well. But you can be late and hit it out of here right down the line, as Johnny Lowenstein did in the first game of the playoffs against the Angels. But you'll see Kenny Singleton. You get that ball up over the plate, and he'll go the other way with you and hit it out. Bounces. Blocked by Nicosia. Base runners hold. Trying to keep it low. Get him to hit it down. Keeson with a good sinker. And yet Singleton, a good low ball hitter. Now here you take another peek at it, and a good, good stop right here by Nicosia. Here is a super play by the catcher. Got gloves down, keeps that ball in front of him at all times, and the runners can't advance. The 2 2 pitch to Ken Singleton. Nobody out, two runners aboard. It's up the middle, knocked down by Keeson. He lost his double play when he didn't come out cleanly with it, but he gets single in the first base. The base runner is Bumbley at third now, Belanger at second. It's going to be interesting to see just how big that play right there could be in this entire ball game. Well, when you've got Eddie Murray coming at you, Don, you know the cardinal rules. Stay away from the fastball. The guy will kill you. Hit it out of sight. But you can't always get location on the other stuff. Well, here's a case here. Depending on how Keeson feels and how Nicosia feels about his control. Now, he hasn't been real sharp yet. You've still got first base open. Willie right. Stargell looking in the dugout. Would you rather pitch to Murray or would you rather go to the even the left hand hitter Johnny Lowenstein? The figures to pitch to him carefully. Pitches inside. Ball one. One out. Ball to the outfield. Or a base hit, obviously, to bring home the first run of the game. That's where you've got to try and keep the ball on Eddie Murray. You move the fastball in, sliders in, and then you can tail the fastball down and away from him. He'll have a chance to pull off of it. Ball two. Low. But you want to throw him the curve and change his speed stuff. Dave Paul used to go crazy when with the Yankees when those Yankee pitches would throw him the fast stuff and he would promptly hit it out. He goes to bed thinking fastball. Two and no pitch. Keeson working carefully went outside that time and they're doing just exactly what you suggested Don. I just can't see any reason right here to let Eddie Murray hurt you even though it's only the first inning but you've got a man coming up that. Although Johnny Lowenstein's had a fine year for Baltimore, I got to go to Lowenstein instead of Murray. And Weaver, aware of that, had him swinging on the 3 0 pitch. That's right, he green lighted him. And I'll tell you, Keeson did not take anything off of it either. It's 3 and 1. Walked it. The bases are now loaded with one out. And the runners are Bumbry at third, Belanger at second, Murray at first, and here's Lowenstein. I think one of the key tributes that Earl Weaver has made to three players on this Baltimore ball club, and here's one of them, Johnny Lowenstein. The other is Terry Crowley. The other is Benny Ayala. He says, you know, everybody wants to play. But he says, I can't play everybody all the time. But he says, I've got three vet veterans on this ball club that don't gripe about anything. I platoon them. I'll put them in here. I'll put them in there. They're all up in age, but they all do the job. Pitch is low. Ball one. Snake and sleeves say that tonight, <laughs> let it be Lowenstein. <laughs> he was born in Wolf Point, Montana. 
lives now in Las Vegas. Went school at UC Riverside Anthropology. Ball is hit on the ground to the second baseman, Garner. Throws it away. Two run score. They had the table set. They had every card stacked perfectly. And the ball was hit to Garner. He had trouble right off the bat getting the ball out of his glove. As he sees, he turns, and now he can't find the handle. Now when he throws it, it's way away from Foley, who actually committed himself too early. Now the ball is out in left field. Two run score. Runners at the corners. And Pittsburgh in trouble here in the first. Called it on the button, Donald, because that ball slipped up his glove and he had trouble corralling it and then threw hurriedly and errantly. Doug Desensei comes up now with Murray over at third and Lowenstein at first. Two runs are in, one RBI involved. Bumbry coming home is an RBI. The other run scoring on the error. The numbers on Desensei for the year. He was four for 13, however, against the Angels in the championship series. He is better than a 230 hitter. It was an off year for him, but he still retained that occasional home run power with 16 of them. Notable in the American League for his ability to hit Ron Gidley. Jim Rooker is now up and throwing in the bullpen for the Pittsburgh Pirates as Keeson almost got out of the jam. Almost. There's Rooker, left-handed. Well, Tanner's going to have to make a move early. He's going to make the move, which could force Weaver to make some changes in his batting order. First pitch, low and away. That's Eddie Murray at third. At first is Johnny Lowenstein. Well, Earl Weaver will go right around with Chuck Tanner. I mean, you can tell you can put on one sleeve at a time with both of them because that's, they will match one another. That's right. That's the key characteristic of both men. Use of the total roster. The pitch is high. I think also in all due fairness and there is the staff of Pittsburgh as Willie Stargell will go in with Nicosia and Keeson and try and just settle things down a little bit and I'll do fairness to Doug DeSense he had a bad back at the early part of the year hurt it in infield practice and he missed quite a few games so he's been fighting that problem but as you said Howard he is such a better hitter than 230 and what a play he made in the championship series he might have just got Baltimore right here on Anderson on Jimmy Anderson that's right I don't know where Baltimore finds it but they come up with some guys at third base don't they the goal. two balls no strikes the count crowd yelling balk which it was not no, it was not. And of course, Baltimore, they have seen that play right there as he faked the third while the runner at first, Lowenstein, was walking back to the bag. He wasn't going to get caught. Ball bounces away from Nicosia. Murray comes to the plate. It's 3 0 Baltimore. Mistakes by the Pirates, hurting them here in the bottom of the first inning. The very thing the Pirates have not been doing until this inning. Well, here's a ball down in the dirt. Nikoja tries to make the play on the ball, and it's just such a bad pitch that he cannot get down there. That ball hitting and then bouncing off his right shin guard and going back over towards the Baltimore dugout. No chance to get Murray coming home, and Lowenstein stands at second. That's a wild pitch. Early in the year, the Bucks had a facility for beating themselves. They started poorly, as has so often been there, won't. But if ever a team put it together, the Bucks did in their sweep of the Reds. There's a strike to the sensei. It's three and one now. Three nothing. A single by Bumbry. A walk. Then you had the ground out. Then you had another walk. You had the error on Garner. Now you've got a wild pitch. You've got three runs in. And there's a high drive. Hit the left field. Going way yeah, it's back. Gone. It's gone. Forget it. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Doug DeSensei with that no longer so occasional home run power and the birds are off to a big start as a sign says here in the ballpark the bird will fly that 
Doug DeCense, he can hit him as far as anybody. And, of course, he's ahead on the count. And you talk about these things. He's looking fastball all the way up over the plate. And believe me, I can tell you from past experience, there's nothing that goes further than a high sinker. <laughs> It is 5-0 Baltimore in the bottom of the first inning. And the batter is Billy Smith, the second baseman. Remember this Baltimore team had more than 180 home runs as a team. More than in the Frank Robinson, Boog Powell, Brooks Robinson era. Two balls and no strikes and Doug DeSensei. And nailing a home run, the 15th player to do it in his first trip to the plate. Right? It's two and one. Well, that's a typical Baltimore rally right here. They could have been out of the inning. Pittsburgh could have with no run score. Yep. They fouled up the double play ball, and Baltimore took advantage. They always do, or did, all year long. Change up makes it two and two. Rick Dempsey's on deck. Heeson's thrown 26 pitches up there. Phil Garner. That struck down into the right field area. Skids in for a base hit. Parker slips, almost falls down, but gets the throw back in. So Smith is on with a single. And once again, the change in the lineup by Weaver pays off. Tanner goes to the mound. We'll see Rooker, I suspect, rather shortly. He's already pointed to the bullpen, and Jim Rooker is coming on. You talked earlier, Keith, about Keeson not throwing either last night or early today. Yep. Keeson came to Haddocks this morning and said if the Pirates had other plans about another starter, he'd be agreeable. Ha Haddocks said you're still our pitcher, but makes you wonder about his confidence, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Time is out. We'll be right back. The grounds crew out there replacing turf, putting down some sand and trying to repair the area that Dave Parker tore up when he came over to field that line single by Billy Smith. You see his feet go out from under him there and with the feet went the turf leaving some big holes so they are fixing it now as Jim Rooker with a record of four and seven comes in in relief of Bruce Keeson who is not able to get out of the first inning. Well what they're actually doing in the outfield they're taking towels and going out and they're trying to sop up some of the water. They'll take the towels, they'll stamp on them, and then they'll go squeeze them into the bucket. Boy, it, I, it's just amazing that they got this game in tonight. When I woke up this morning and looked out the window, oh. like somebody Sorry. mentioned, they said they thought they overslept because it was snowing out. There he is, the starting pitcher for the Birds tomorrow. One of the greatest pitchers of his time, Jim Palmer, with 225 career victories. On Saturday at 3.30 Eastern Time, one of the premier football games of almost any season, third-ranked Oklahoma against fourth-ranked Texas. The Sooners and the Horns having at it in the Cotton Bowl down in Dallas. Should be a good one. Rooker at 37 years of age. Lakeview, Oregon, now living in Library, Pennsylvania. Came over from Kansas City. Gene Garber back in 1972. In 1977, he was 14 and 9, originally signed as an outfielder. So he gets the call early as Pittsburgh defensive mistakes send Bruce Keeson out of the ball game very early. Keeson going one third of an inning. You still only have one out. Rick Dempsey now comes to the plate with a pitcher, Mike Flanagan, standing on deck and five big runs across the plate. Key era by Phil Garner, who has been a truly sensational player down the stretch run. And Don't forget in the that tap back to the mound, though, that Keeson could have handled That's and could true. have a double, too. Exactly. Smith at first base now with one out. And here's Rick Dempsey, four for ten in the playoff series. Outside the ball one. Jerry Newdecker back at the plate calling the balls and strikes. He is from the American League. Is the strike zone different? Well, it depends on who you ask. 
There's one. It's one and one. We'll find out about that tomorrow when Bob Engel of the National League works behind the plate with Jim Palmer, high fastball pitcher, throwing his stuff in there. That will be interesting. Line to the shortstop Foley. Throw to first base. Throws it away. Billy Smith's going to go to second. Stargell overruns the ball and Smith's in there. You've got two out. And that oh. ball was hit like a shot and the box, as you can see, are very rattled. Now this ball hit hard. Now Timmy has a chance at Billy Smith at first base. All he's got to do is make a decent throw. But the throw is away from Stargell. He can't make the play. Smith was hesitant about going to second base. If Stargell plays the carom and plays it cleanly, he's got a chance to throw him out at second base. So that is the second Pittsburgh air here in the first inning. Plus one of omission. That's right. Well, here's Flanagan's first at bat in a long time. <laughs> Once hit three home runs when he was playing at the University of Massachusetts against Maine in one game. Yeah. Got his name on his own bat too. I'll have you know. That's a lovely lady. That's Mike Flanagan's wife. One strike to the Baltimore pitcher with two out now, and Billy Smith at second base. Five runs in, it's foul back, and it's two strikes. And Mike's <laughs> going to take his cut, isn't he? I say one thing: that's <laughs> throw a pitcher high fastballs, and you know they're going to take a whack at it. <laughs> Once a bird, always a bird. I met Mrs. Flanagan at the Montreal airport. She was up visiting the former bird southpaw Ross Grimsley. They're very close friends. I told Mike she could have made a better marriage. <laughs> <laughs> two strike pitch coming now to Mike Flanagan with two out. He hit 320 at UMass. It's just low. Nikosia comes up with it. It was kind of funny to watch him flipping around the bat in the clubhouse when the supply came in. And they started working a week or so ago and learning to bunt and so forth. He's bouncing the bat around, trying to figure out whether it was 32 or 33 ounces. And if you believe that, Tap around in front. Nikos has got to hurry. In time. And so the first inning is finally over. But what an inning for Baltimore as they take the lead five to nothing. Mike Flanagan will pitch to Willis Stargell, Bill Madlock, and Steve Nikosia. Before the ball game, Howard Cosell talked with the Baltimore lefty. Mike, explain why you became an even better pitcher this year than you were a year ago. How and when it happened? Well, I think uh, early in the year I was having trouble with my curveball, and that was been my main pitch uh, all of last year. And uh, I kind of decided I'd better do something quick because I was getting knocked out of some of the games early. So I worked with Scotty McGregor on his changeup and a slider. And I think I what put me over the hump was the changeup, and it made me a four-pitch pitcher instead of a two-pitch pitcher. That's hard to say. Two pitch pitcher, four pitch pitcher. He said it very well. He's a dandy pitcher, however you want to put it. But you were talking a moment ago and mentioning the fact that he had the Angels down nine to one. And That's right. Him. Key point. Bucks like the Angels can come back. Willie Stargell represents the lumber portion in the Pirate lineup. They call Parker Lightning and Stargell Lumber. And it's probably the loosest bunch of guys I've ever seen in a baseball clubhouse. They do enjoy themselves and they are very dangerous when they take the offense. The wives of the Baltimore Orioles seated there. There's the pretty lady. Married to Doug DeCense. They were having dinner in Little Italy down here two nights ago, and Doogie was mobbed by about 50 kids as he came out of the restaurant. Stood there and signed for every one of them. So here's Willie. Five for 11 in the championship series. And the first pitch from Mike Flanagan is high and inside for ball one. Can't be overemphasized that this man is one of the most remarkable men in American sport. 
Well, I'll tell you something. If the pitch is in for a strike one and one, you'd like Willis Stargell no matter what he did. Exactly. He is a great human being off the field. His work with sickle cell anemia a lesson. Change and Willis Waven, and it's one and two. A lesson in humanity and his feeling for his fellow man. The outfield shifted to the right, way back. You could just look at the glove of Dempsey right there. That tells you the book on Stargell, a good low ball hitter. Dempsey, he almost had to come out of a crouch and stand up to get that target up high enough on Stargell. Well, he sewed up the pennant clincher, golfing a low one at three rivers. He goes again for the changeup and misses and strikes out. That's the second strikeout by Flanagan. Good breaking pitch right here. It took just a little bit off. Stargell, you see, way out in front and in an excellent location. The batter is Bill Madlock, who is also one of the pieces to the puzzle that fit perfectly. If you look at their record, he may have been the key piece. I'll develop that in a second, Keith. All right, now's the time to do it. Before Matlock joined the Bucks, they had won 37 and lost 34. After Matlock came, the Bucks won 61 and lost 30. What a difference. Came from the Giants. High foul back in the crowd. That's souvenir number three. By the way, that five runs in the first inning is a World Series record for game one. Oh. One and one. Bill Matlock, of course, as he takes a pitch right on the inside corner at the knees for strike two, jumped into the headlines as he won the batting championship over with the Chicago Cubs successively. Sharp shot, third base to Sensei. How cold are the fingers? Not the Doug. Two down. Doogie is reminding them of Brooks Robinson. Said it was the proudest moment of his life as you look at him again. Had a, just a fractional instant of trouble with it, but plenty of time for the throw on the right handed hitter. Said it gave him his greatest joy after that play against Anderson, Don, in the game you called when they likened them after the game to Brooksy. Here's one of the finest plays I've ever seen, Howard. Steve Nicosia, the Pittsburgh catcher, hits it on the ground, backhanded nicely by Billy Smith. And so Mike Flanagan gets the Pirates in order in the top of the second inning. And after one and a half in Baltimore, the Orioles lead it by a score of five to nothing. And this was a good defensive play by Smith as he took his time with it. Threw him out. So after one and a half, with the temperature getting down into the 30s now, Baltimore leads at 5 zip. <laughs> I agree. But it's the World Series, and it's been played in snow and rain for all the years. 26 times there have been games postponed, but once the bell rings, the weather is forgotten. Al Bumby now will lead it off for Baltimore in the bottom of the second inning. Belanger Singleton will follow. It'll be the top of the order. The Orioles batted around. The umpires are now coming in to have a conversation with Jerry Newdecker. Well, it's the right field umpire, and that is Paul Rungi coming in, and he's telling, I believe, Jerry Newdecker, saying, hey, I believe we need some help out there. They've been working out in left field. We need some help out in right field. I believe that Parker might have complained a little bit. We saw the play before, back in the first inning, where Parker slipped on that ball, and he might be telling him, say, look at Let's get these guys ready to go out here in right field a little bit in between innings. So that's what they're doing. I believe they're going to try and get the ground screw. They're going to try and move them out into right field to try and sop up some of that water out there. And you saw at the top of the program, they just poured here yesterday, rained all night, snowed this morning, then turned into rain, and now they call. The man that you talked to, Howard. That's Lee. right, Pat Santarone, who is a veteran groundskeeper, head groundskeeper here, of course. You heard him say in the pregame telecast that they played in worse conditions back in the 71 series. 
Bowie Kuhn was criticized by some last night. As Bowie is looking on right now, there he is. He was criticized by some for they felt delaying the calling of the game last night. He felt he was in a no-win position to give his side of it. He felt, what if I had called it before scheduled game time and it had stopped raining? Well, he was exactly right, Howard. He was in a no-win position. And the next thing I knew, some were blaming television, saying we were holding up the game, which indicates an almost massive absence of knowledge of the position of television in the matter. I believe now what they have told the grounds crew to do is to go back and get prepared to go out into right field this next inning, and I, maybe they're not even going to go out there as yet. They will let Rooker keep working because Paul Rungi is standing down right by first base talking with his fellow National Leaguer Bob Engel and now he will move out into position and we'll see what happens in between innings. All right Paul's ready so is Al Bunbury step again with Belanger moving to the on deck circle and Jim Rooker who relieved Keeson the book on Keeson incidentally one third of an inning four earned runs three hits struck out nobody and walked two and the first pitch to Bunbury is strike one. This is the kind of fellow who is not only the catalyst of the club as Don stated but he is a good solid hitter. He he'll get you key hits with key ribbies. We had him here in a Monday night game during the year when he got the big hit with an opposite field home run. Remember that's right. Fouls it back. This will neutralize him just a little bit. I Left didn't think you could get up from under the table like that. <laughs> Told you, I'm used to ducking those. Supposed to be partly cloudy and cool tomorrow. And the series moves over to Pittsburgh as Bumbry fouls it back into the crowd. John Candelaria is bound to be a key figure in the pitching rotation for Pittsburgh. Notice those stars on his the peak of his cap. Those are stars awarded to every member of the team when deserving of it in the opinion of Willie Stodgill. They are called Stodgill stars. And because Stodgill has inspirational qualities getting those stars from Willie is one of the things that has knit the Pirates together to the point where they're called family. A one two pitch is low it's two two will have spent about fifteen hundred dollars out of his own pocket to buy some six thousand of them and he's generous with them uh, he just passes them around anybody that does something noble will it plunks a star on him. He must have expected big things this year. <laughs> <laughs> must have had a feeling. You can watch the approach of Bumbry on that breaking pitch a little different than off a right hander. Chops it back to the mound pitcher Rooker throws him out. So Jim gets a little easier start than did the starter Keeson. Belanger up he walked in the first inning. And that walk was a Keeson mistake. You mentioned his failure to handle Singleton's ball cleanly to execute or start the double play. But the walk to Mark immediately had Bumbry in scoring position. Rooker quick on the outside corner with a fastball. Strike one. Belanger in his fourth World Series. Strike two. Good breaking pitch that time, right down on the knees of Belanger. It was a beauty. One star. He's gone. Belanger looks at strike three. You know the thing that have you make make you feel awful bad as you look at this next pitch by Rooker and he came back with another dandy curveball. Belanger started couldn't pull the trigger and in a good location. But I was going to say the thing that have to make you feel awfully bad is if you went through that whole season and never had a star. Just hold the door for <laughs> Willie. That's about it. Hold the door for everybody. <laughs> Kenny Singleton out pitcher to first his first time up. Switch hitter goes to the right side against the left hander and Rooker misses outside for ball one. Two out nobody on. He's a different player this year from a year ago. So confident because he's got his strength back. 
after two seasons ago he underwent shoulder surgery and he fell almost helpless trying to throw from right field last year that was part of why the Orioles outfield last year was a relatively sorry lot defensively it was a big swing you saw that uh, statistic offered on your screen there that he's been very productive when Mike Flanagan has been on the mound and to talk about the arm from right field in 1979 he had eight assists he only had one in 1978, so that's testimony to the strength of the arm as well. That's rolled, and it's fair. And Madlock makes a fine play, and they don't get him. The throw's in the dirt. we got to call out a hit, though. We'll be hearing from Kenny Singleton in just a couple of minutes, and you'll hear him explaining how he became a new man. This is a good play by Madlock to get over to the ball and then all of a sudden his momentum carries him across. He doesn't get real good footing and then the throw a little bit shallow Singleton with a slide. I don't know whether he comes up with that ball. Here we look at it again. Makes a good play but not going away from the bag. That's a tough play for any third baseman. Well he wasn't playing the line. Sometimes a guy plays the line when you don't expect him to be playing the line. And that's what the sensei was doing on the hit by Anderson. Exactly he was right. playing the line. There was no reason for Matlock to be playing the line on that occasion. Not right uh, now. Protecting against an extra base hit. Eddie Murray also turns and goes to the other side of the plate against the left hander, and Rooker is outside for ball one. Keith, he's got power both ways, believe me. And he's about the same type hitter both ways. As Howard stated before, just a good, solid fastball hitter. Change it outside. Now you see the way Rook is trying to work him. Gone with cute stuff. Trying not to give him the fastball, if at all possible. Lowenstein on deck, two out. Singleton at first. Hit the center, base hit. Ball gets out to center field in a hurry. Really skips to the outfield out in that area. This is good shape. Well, that was it. The low fastball, and he hit a rocket. Look at that record against Baltimore. Not very impressive, is it? He was with the Royals at the time, of course. And Lowenstein, Lowenstein, forgive me, Keith, stays in there. With a 5 nothing lead, why not? Well, it's still very early. Of course, if you go to make your defensive changes right now, well, Pittsburgh's got seven more whacks at you, and you can't count them out. They can play catch up in a hurry. Two on, two out. As Lowenstein stands in, swings and misses on a breaking pitch for strike one. If this was, say, maybe the seventh inning, sixth inning, seventh inning right there, why Earl Weaver, in all probability, yeah. would go to Gary Renicky. Maybe, but with a 5 nothing lead. Not right now, not in the second inning. Never. This guy's a kind of self-taught psychologist, Johnny Lowenstein. Adjusted beautifully to spot play. That pitch misses. It's one and one. I think we touched on it a moment ago, but when you have good, solid professional athletes sitting on that bench available for spot play who don't run around and do clubhouse lawyering and, and just go about and do their job, that's a very valuable ingredient in the assemblage of a team. And that's what they've got here. It certainly is. Both teams are an effect family. Right. John checks on it, cost him one and two. John will tell you real quick, he's not fooled at all. He's not an everyday player. He's really a fun guy to be around. He's an anthropology graduate of UC Riverside, out in California. Booker comes outside. Now two and two. The base runners are Ken Singleton at second and Eddie Murray at first. Waiting on deck, Doug DeSensei, who homered back in the first inning, good for two runs. 37-year-old Jim Rooker blows the fastball in there, and Lowenstein strikes out. So Baltimore doesn't go down easy in the second, but they do hold them, and the Orioles lead it five to nothing. 
There's the effort to repair the holes, and I would imagine with all the water they've had, it's. In fact, I can see another spot out there in short right field where the seepage or the water's sort of maybe coming up out of the ground. But there's definitely a small puddle, about 25 or 30 yards from where they're working right now. It's just plain old-fashioned mud. Well, I think the big thing here, as we mentioned before, that the Baltimore Colts played here, and where it is so obvious with all the mud and the water would be actually on the sidelines of the football field where the players were and there are some spots where they're moving in out in right field right now they're in normal positions of where the outfielders will play the outfielders will play a little bit different here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore there's tomorrow's game eight o'clock Eastern and on Friday there'll be no off day don't forget also eight o'clock Eastern time game three but the outfielders here in Baltimore will bunch. There's Kenny Singleton. We told you he had become a new man and he had explained how. Here's my talk with him. You're a new person in the outfield. Explain why. Well, this year I have more confidence. Uh, last year uh, I didn't really want the ball hit to me because I couldn't really throw it back the way I wanted to. This year I really feel good in the outfield. Uh, I've been throwing the ball well all year, all season long, and uh, you know the runners seem to be stopping this year. They don't try and keep going anymore. This relates to your off-season surgery. Uh, yes, uh, two years ago. Last year was a different story. Everybody got on first, couldn't wait to get go to third base on it. This year they seem to be holding up quite a bit. Three game comments of Kenny Singleton, Phil Garner. The Pirates' second baseman is the batter. Strike one on him. The pitcher, Rooker, is scheduled to come next. And then the top of the order, Moreno, and that's fouled high up in the air and drifting back into the crowd. This is a Peppa Pot ball player, this Phil Garner. And talk about clutch play at 377 during the month of September with some key home runs. We saw the graphic on him. There's a pitch right there that is a bread and butter pitch for Mike Flanagan. That hard slider or breaking pitch right down on the inside corner of those right hand hitters. They have a tendency to give up on it. That's three strikeouts now for Mike. Here's Jim Rooker coming to the plate. Hits from the right side. The Angels caught up to Flanagan as we noted when he had a nine to one lead in the game that the birds hung on to win nine to eight. But here in Memorial Stadium. They very rarely, as you looked at a call ball, ever hit Flanagan. We showed you a graphic to that effect early. He was 14 and 2 here all year long. That's not bad. Rooker fouls it off. And the count now. One and one. Mike pitched last Thursday in that second playoff game. And in that game, Ray Miller, the pitching coach of Baltimore, said he had the best fastball he'd had all month. Staying pretty much in the high 80s and low 90s with it. Oh, look at this. Rooker lays it down. Flanagan makes the play. Jimmy trying to get it down toward third base, and I think if he'd been able to roll it more down the line, I don't think the Sins had gotten him. I don't believe so. If he'd have got it down the line, you're exactly right, because he got it actually between the line and the pitcher's mound. World Series history on the Pittsburgh Pirates. See that they lost 1903. That was really not the Red Sox. It's what it's the franchise that became the Red Sox. They called them Boston Pilgrims back in those days. It's a new fan. Uh, yeah, my blanket, huh? <laughs> Pretty well behaved dog to endure all this noise and be so passive about it. Omar Moreno coming up now. Rolled out to the second baseman first time up. Let's see if he gets on. It's going to be interesting to see what he does first time he's on. But they are down 5 nothing, So he can't be as ambitious perhaps as he might like to be. The sensei is in on the grass now. He's not going to give Moreno as much room down that line as he did Rooker. And Moreno chucks it. And then the ball sails gently out into center field. And the catch made by Bumbry to end the top of the third inning. So after two and a half innings of play in game one of the 79 World Series, it's 5 nothing Baltimore. That's Dave Parker, highest paid player in baseball. And that fact militated against him early this season. 
our conversation explains why and what happened. You seem much more at peace with yourself than I think I've ever seen you because you were troubled even when you got the huge contract. You were shocked by some of the letters you received, some of the public reaction that was so adverse. You've settled down now, haven't you? Yes, I have. I think I really had to, to battle with myself to just realize that, hey, you know, with all the things that's taking place uh, uh, with the contract that, that came along with it was uh, the people breaking in my house, vandalizing my home, of course, they vandalized my car a few times, but I just finally put it in a proper perspective. Well, baseball is my life. This is what I, I got to do for a living, and, uh, hey, without baseball, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I just kind of pushed everything else to the side and say, well, hey, when I'm on the field, I'm in my own world. Can't nobody mess with me here. And, I think it took about a half a season for me to get that together, but I did have quite a few things to sidetrack me from my concentration towards the gang, and I just fought to, to get that back and just realize when I'm on the field that I'm in my world and can't nobody bother me out here. It's a terrible thing when you are penalized for being successful, but he's got it in perspective and he's a heck of a player. Doug DeSensei is up there. You know, Brooks Robinson hit a home run in his first at-bat, the 1966 series. The man who has succeeded him now has hit a home run in the first at bat. Well, we're happy to be here. Just glad the snow didn't stick. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> that was the series when they belted the Dodgers. Yes. Four games in a row, and Kurt Bleffrey made a catch here. The Dodgers still don't believe. Right, Donald? That's right, and I know who he hit the first home run off of. Who? <laughs> 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 the say at the plate, the pitch is low, it's ball one. <laughs> Billy Smith's on deck, and Rick Dempsey will follow. We were talking about Baltimore setting a first inning record in a first game. I thought they broke that off. I thought they scored more than that off me. <laughs> five nothing Baltimore leading with five big ones in the first. The crowd out there in the bleachers and left field yelling hit another one Dougie and the pitch is in there for a strike. It's one and one. Two on the outside corner. Suffered a slight pull Saturday in Anaheim Stadium playing against the Angels when he went around first. Whirlpool treatment yesterday and his left leg back of the knee. He's all right. Jim Rucker relieved Bruce Keeson in the first inning. Count is now two and two. Four of the five runs on the board earned. But Pittsburgh had actually three opportunities to get off the hook and didn't do it. Shot foul. You know, just watching Jim Rooker throw tonight, he started the year on the disabled list, but he's throwing well tonight. Cal Ripken is the third base coach for Baltimore. Jim Fry at first base. Now that could be dangerous playing that far off the line against Dookie, couldn't it, Don? Well, he's not he's not too bad. He really isn't. Uh, the sensei is not really what you'd call necessarily a dead pull hitter. Trying to protect a little bit to the hole. Pretty good pitch. Yes, it was. He has Dookie leaning. And he tried to bring it from the outside in. He tried to bring a breaking pitch out there, and he just did miss. Count is full at three and two on the sensei. He's another California. A lot of those fellas in baseball, good reason for it. The weather out there enabling the youngsters to play year round. And they develop it. So the sensei gets a free pass to first base from Rooker. Second baseman, Billy Smith. Billy Smith comes up now, and Smith had a single in his first trip tonight. You know, Keith, one of the things I'm sure that had to enter Earl Weaver's mind in changing his lineup just a little bit and putting Billy Smith in at second base instead of Rich Dower with the starter Keeson, what Weaver has going for him is an added plus. He has got, as you look at Weaver down in the dugout, he's got an added plus because he's got Singleton, Murray, and Smith that are all switch hitters. So all they have to do is turn around. Not only that, as our graphic showed, Don, Smith has been a hot hitter. He has in the recent days. Madlock jumps and gets it. Second one, back to first two. The 
just a little more bounce it's in left field that ball was hit hard and Matlock did make a good play he had it right up you can see a lot of white showing now he has to reach in make sure he gets Anna the sensei he comes in hard but Garner has just enough time to get the ball out of the way Rick Dempsey Catcher. Had a pretty fair series in the American League playoffs, didn't he? Rookie is just low. Well, I, I agree with Howard when he was talking about the comparisons between the two starting lineups. That this guy right here has got to be one of the most underrated catchers in the American League, and maybe all of baseball. He does an excellent job. He's a great handler of pitchers. He calls a good game, and he's got an excellent arm. Really gotten two vital commodities from the Yankees, haven't they? Rick Dempsey and Scott McGregor. Yes, sir. And there's a youngster named Martinez hasn't done badly for them either. Tippy. And great right out on the bullpen. Three balls and no strikes now to Rick Dempsey with two out. Mike Flanagan, the pitcher, waiting on deck. Five nothing, Baltimore. Three and one. I would suggest I think two uh, three one pitch bat comes apart bounced out to the second baseman Garner throws over to first and gets him. And so Dempsey bounces out to end the third inning and play it after three the Orioles lead the Pirates five nothing. Want to see a bat explode watch this. Dempsey's bat just literally comes apart. And he's thrown out at first base. When that lumber, most splinters start flying around, tis a time to be nimble. And when you get the ball out on the end of the bat like that in this kind of weather where it's down in the 30s, you just go back to the dugout and count your fingernails. NFL football on ABC. That's a big one Sunday night. The Rams against the Cowboys. The Cowboys now in possession of John Dutton, one of the finest defensive linemen in football, acquired by way of trade with the Colts of Baltimore. Then Monday night, the Vikes against the Jets. In the meantime, Tim Foley, and this, my friend, is a contact hitter, Keith. And it's also the second time around for the batting order for the Pittsburgh Pirates against Mike Flanagan. Parker will follow, and then comes Bill Robinson. Birds are leading five to nothing, and Mike Flanagan's fastball has plenty of pop in it to strike one. When I say contact hitter, Keith, he has struck out only once. That's foul. In his last 238 at bats. Dandy catch by the young lady, the <laughs> ball girl down the left. Line. And he hasn't struck out at all in his last 138 at bats. So he meets the ball. Looped out into short center field and it drops. See what Base I mean? Yep. He'll get wood on it one way or another. Well, he's up on the bat handle about four inches, and that'll tell you something right there. Listen, you remember a guy, the late Mr. Branch, Ricky, used to say he can't hit, he can't run, he can't field, he can't throw. What he can do is win. He talked to the brat, Eddie Stanky. Well, Timmy Foley may be an uppercase Eddie Stanky. Dave Parker normally uses a piece of wood at the plate, 37 ounces and 37 inches, and the average man needs help to tote it. Well, I know one thing. If that's what <laughs> that's what he's using, you've got to be strong to swing that. <laughs> you have got to be strong. But he has gone as high as 39. Pitch is high and tight. Interesting thing about the Bucks with their left hand power, primarily in the form of this man in Stargell. They've been shut out by a southpaw only once this year, Don. And that was Pete Falcone of the Mets. In one of his rarely uh, uh, effective, one of his rare effective performances. Parker up there. Swings and misses, and it's one and one. Dave doubled his first time up, has one of the two hits, and that pitch came into the plate at 90 miles an hour. This misses Jim Rooker right there. Oh, Dave. As you watch the Flanagan 
And the way he comes set and then kicks and comes to the plate, he's got a good move because he really does not commit himself. He gets up there and he balances. And that's that's a good move. A left-hander that can do that, it's got to be an added plus. They cannot take the liberty to run on you. 2-1 pitch, he goes to first. And Foley wasn't that far off, and he almost picked him off. He's had a poor move in the past. He got eight this year, Don. That's, that's quite a few. In the right field, base hit, Parker two for two. Foley turns at second. He's going to third, and he's in there. So you see the southpaw isn't stopping. Those are the Pittsburgh wives. And they've seen that team come from way behind so many times this past season. But Parker two for two against the southpaw. Bill Robinson struck out swinging first time up as Flanning, uh, Flanagan threw him a diving spinning curve that was a beautiful pitch. Now there is a graphic that shows you a significant difference for this year at least against lefties as against righties. Nobody out runners at the corner Foley at third Parker at first Parker has plenty of speed 20 out of 24 in stolen bases and Robinson fouls it off for strike one. Park is amazing. The end of the season, he was going to the opposite field with such great success. He'll go any way on you using that ballpark. He can do so many things. High chopper at third base. Foley holds. DeSensei makes the play. Parker goes to second, one out. Now there's a smart play by Tim Foley at third base. He had a notion to try and come, but there's no need to even try. You're down five all. Not the only that, the ball the hit in front of him. Right in front of him. He started to come, and then he kind of kicked himself a little bit, but he made the right play. Here is the big man. Look at that hitting in the National League Championship Series. Tremendous competitor for MVP honors in the league. You can tell how cold it is. The breath pretty steamy. Winds it up, and the pitch is inside. Interesting now as you look at Chuck Tanner because he's got the towel wrapped around his neck because it's chilly as Ethan and all of us have noted. Flanagan has not gone to the chain. That's interesting. And I'm just watching and wondering how long it's going to be before he goes back to that chain. Got Willie on it. Let's see. Fast ball and it's a shot. Second baseman has it. Throw to first base. Run scores. Two out. And finally Pittsburgh gets on the board. Parker going over to third. The Foley comes home as Willie Stargell gets an RBI. Two down. Madlock coming to the plate. Said before of the two ball clubs on the field, the Pirates have got to be the one that you would say, well, they can play catch up with you. They can catch you if you get a big lead. Bill takes it low. But if you go into the ninth inning trailing Baltimore, they have some of the most incredible statistics in the history of the game. It's almost impossible to catch them on the record, or at least this past year, Don. They can throw some stoppers at you. They've got them sitting out there in that bullpen. I'll guarantee you that. Both clubs have excellent relievers. They don't beat themselves. You know they don't. There's a change. What a beautiful pitch. One and one to count, and here's the pitch. Well, he's just got Madlock fooled. That's all there is to that. Bill might have thought it might have been a little low. One one. Madlock takes it. Makes it two and one. Nikosia's on deck. Swinging that paddle, warming up. Two and two. You could see the finger, and then he went inside. And that's exactly where Flanagan threw it. He hit that inside corner beautifully. See where he wants to go this time, and we can pick up the sign from Dempsey. That's foul. Oops. Souvenir Hunter out of the stands. Goes back in a hurry. 
lot of memories for some of these players on each team as they look back to the 1971 series. Coming back inside. Foul again. Pretty much the same place. <laughs> Get down underneath that tarp to dig it out. <laughs> <clears throat> the Lancia talks about how the Birds won the first two in 71 and thought they had it cinched. The Bucks won the next three. Then the Birds won. And then Roberto Clemente finished. Fouled away. Count holds at 2 2. That's Timmy Foley's wife, a lovely young blonde lady. She and her husband both thought his career might be finished with the Mets this year, and they sent him away a new life. Oh, Madlock got all of that one, didn't he? Just, just foul. This is a tough hitter. Tough. Flanagan got a little fortunate right there. He hung that breaking pitch up over the plate. And he hit it on the screws. It's a man who's found a home here. Every other manager tried to fit me into a mold, Matlock says, but not Chuck Tanner. He lets you be yourself. Just outside, it's now a full count, three balls and two strikes. One run is in for Pittsburgh. Dave Parker is over at third. You've got two out. Matlock has got a, to me, has got just a great swing. Very very short and very compact. Full count coming. Now time. You can see right there Madlock was not going to take his eye off of Flanagan. He held his right hand up and said time time if he doesn't get it he's got to get it back on the bat. Ball four. Runners at the corner now with two out. That's pretty close pitch. It sure was. Watch it again. He's trying to get the fastball up a little bit. Catcher, save the catcher. Just off the inside corner. That's the first walk issued in the ball game by Mike Flanagan. Steve Nicosia is at the plate. Nicosia's first time up. He rolled out to the right second here. baseman, and there's Mrs. Meditate, Nicosia. meditate. Let's go, Nick. Let's go, Nick. Played Winter Bowl 1976. He caught Mike Flanagan during Winter Bowl. We're in the top of the fourth inning, and it's a 5 1 ball game as Flanagan is inside. And. The Baltimore bullpen now with Sammy Stewart getting loose just in case. Neither manager on average will waste time. Tanner stayed with Keeson in the first inning. That's hit on the ground to Belanger. The shortstop over the second to short way to get Matlock coming down from first base. And the top of the fourth is over. But Pittsburgh punches through to get one run. And we are at 5-1 in the middle of the fourth. There's the line score in the ball game as we go to the bottom of the fourth inning for Baltimore. The pitcher Mike Flanagan, Al Bumbry, Mark Belanger Flanagan says his most memorable moment at the bat came in 1975 at Rochester when they'd give away $50 for hitting the home run leading off the sixth inning. One time the home run pool got up to $800 and you know what? He won it. Hit a home run leading off in the sixth inning. Oklahoma Texas coming up on Saturday out of the Cotton Bowl in Dallas both teams undefeated one of the great rivalries in college football. We'll have it for you at 330 Eastern 230 Central and 1230 Pacific. And then I'm going to the Texas State Fair and eat a whole bunch of cotton candy. Mm. I tell you that Texas defense appears to be exceptional. Very good. I also have a young kicker named Goodson who's hit uh, eight field goals in the last two ball games. I haven't been able to get in the end zone all that much. Chuck Tanner now pacing around in the dugout. That big guy with him is Bob Skinner. Out on the mat is Jim Rooker. In relief for Bruce Keeson. Burt Blylevin scheduled tomorrow night for Pittsburgh against Jim Palmer for Baltimore. Here's Mike. Who was thrown out by the catcher his first time up. <laughs>
First pitch from Rooker to Flanagan is inside. For ball one. I was mentioning that neither manager will wait long because of what they've both got in the bullpens. Should there be any trouble coming up. But Tanner did stay with Keeson because Keeson got into first inning trouble, not solely through his fault. Count is now two balls and one strike to Flanagan. When the series is done, Mike and Kathy will move to their new house in Amherst, New Hampshire, it's about 15 miles west of Manchester. He's hoping one of his trophies that's fouled away is going to be the Cy Young Award. I don't think he has much to worry about in that regard. Bill Robinson and Mrs. Bill Robinson. They know what it is to struggle. They thought Bill wouldn't make it because of what happened to him with the Yankees, a dismal experience. That's pop back foul out of play. But with the Phils and with the Bucks, he formed a new career. He had come up to the Yankees by way of trade from the Atlanta organization, and he was highly touted. Great natural ability, but it didn't work for him in New York. Enrique Romo crank it up in the bullpen for Pittsburgh. Uh, he came over from Seattle and he's performed nobly for them this season. Had Mike leaning on it, took it three and two to count now on the Baltimore pitcher. Now the reason they have Romo up the pitcher is the scheduled second hitter. So Chuck Tanner will go to his bench. They're getting along now. Baltimore at bat bottom of the fourth inning. Flanagan rolls over the right side. Fourth on the Chargers glove. And Flanagan's on. Well, let us see now. Will the pitcher get a hit? Or will the pitcher, uh, first baseman for Pittsburgh, get an error? Looks to me like an error. But we'll see. I got to believe Willie Stargell would like to have those hit to him all day long because I think he'll make the play all day long. But he just didn't get in. Give him an error. They give an error, and that's a good call. Third error in the ball game for Pittsburgh. Third. And the first one was terribly expensive. Now Bumbry with Mark Belanger to the on deck circle. Bumbry in the ball game, a single score to run. The first run of the game, he's one for two. Turns to Bunt, takes it, strike. That's Romo continuing to warm up in the bullpen for Pittsburgh. He may have been waiting on a pinch hitting situation, Don, but he's a guy who'll show you six pitches, seven pitches a game if necessary. Well, that's exactly true. Rooker gets in trouble right here. He won't hesitate to bring somebody in to get out of the inning, and then he'll pinch hit for them and go to the next guy. Exactly. Bumbrey taking a good, long, hard look at the third base coach, Cal Ripken. He's offered the bunt on two occasions. The ball of strike count is one and one, with the pitcher Flanagan running at first base. Pulls it back and takes it. It's two and one. There's a left-hander, Dave Roberts, now joining Romo in the bullpen. So Chuck's warming up from both sides. Well, it's three and one. Now here's a case right here. When you know the man's going to bunt, he's told everybody in the ballpark he's going to bunt. You may as well let him bunt. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. You may as well just go ahead and let him bunt. No need being fine with him. And you have the runner at first base with the pitcher. If he gets it down, you might be able to have a play at second base. He finally puts it down. Rooker comes down to get it. Flanagan goes on to second. Garner covers it first. Bumber speed makes it close. Flanagan running on the bases. And remember, we're not using the designated hitter. In this alternate year of the World Series, playing at the National League way, it is a cold night. The pitcher's been standing out there for quite a while. 
This is where a lot of people have the pros and cons about that designated hitter. Here's what they like to see in the middle of the summer where you have the pitcher running the bases like that and just check the stamina of that pitcher and see if he can go nine innings and run the bases a few times. Mark Belanger the batter with one out. You don't like the D.H. do you? Well, not especially. Belanger swings and misses. You see Madlock the third baseman of course Belanger can handle that bat so well and Madlock knows that through their scouting reports he's even with a bag and just off the edge of the grass he is not going to give Belanger the bunt he will bunt on you. When you say Mark can handle the bat so well excuse me Keith you mean because of the experience he can manipulate it despite the hundred sixty seven batting average of the year. Don't let that fool you he can beat you. With a little looper, and it'll carry to center field, and Moreno makes the catch. Two down. Ball had more spin on it. As he went underneath it, and it just lifted right on out to center. Now here's the guy he's got to get by. Singleton. After Singleton Murray. They're a tremendous one-two punch. Here's a case that really puts a lot of burden on the outfield. Now we've talked about the bad weather. We've talked about the outfield being in really tough condition. Well a good outfielder is going to know I've got a pitcher at second base two outs. I got to know that there's a guy at the plate that can hit the ball to me hard for a base hit. I've got to charge it hard because I know I've got to play at the plate. But now I've also got that bad turf. High to right center. Moreno and Parker and it's Parker on the call and the catch. And the inning is over. So Flanagan stops at second base. And after four, Baltimore five and Pittsburgh one. Game number two tomorrow night, 8 o'clock Eastern Time here on ABC. Game number three goes over to Pittsburgh on Friday at 8 Eastern Time. We're concerned right now with the opening game of this 76 World Series. And the Buccaneers with a big crowd having traveled over to Baltimore. They gobbled up every ticket available to them. And they're enjoying a five to one lead right now as we go to the top of the fifth inning and we will go with Don Drysdale to call the play for you and Don this is the third largest crowd for a World Series game here in the stadium's history fifty three thousand seven hundred and thirty five and you've got to give them all credit Keith because they are here under adverse conditions because it is chilly and they had a big crowd here last night that stayed through the rain until they finally called it. But they've right now they've got their Orioles on top five to one as it'll be Garner and then a pinch hitter and we'll go to the top of the order in Omar Moreno. This is the young man who wants to make up and you see how well he hit in the championship series He wants to make up for his critical error in the first inning. Now Garner caught looking his first time at bat at 293 on the regular season. Matty Sanguian has come out to the on deck circle as a pinch hitter. Now Chuck Tanner going to the old pro Manny Sandgian. Manny's another veteran of that 71 series. When the Bucks play the birds it's like a city series. Good change and Flanagan out in front on two. It's that kind of rivalry the cities are not that far apart. That's Mrs. Phil Garner. Usually when Don takes over an inning the runs come in profusion. <laughs> <laughs> One ball and two strikes to Garner. Flanagan out in front. Five to one Baltimore. We're in the top of the fifth. Game number one of the 79 series. Bumbrey, the book on Garner, it appears for Baltimore. He will play him in right center field. And just missed inside. And Flanagan, Flanagan. Yep, you saw that. Didn't like the call, Don. Not too happy. But I'll have to throw another one right there and see how it I get. See the pitch again. Pretty close. The 2 2 pitch. And he came right back with that same pitch again, and Garner just did get a piece of it. Two balls, two strikes. Garner, the leadoff hitter, in the Bucks fifth. Hit hard and hooking away from Lowenstein. It'll go to the wall. Garner on his way for two. As Lowenstein will hit the cutoff man Belanger and Garner leads it off in the Pittsburgh fifth with a double. 
So as they started the lineup the second time around last inning, they began to get to Flanagan and scored a run. Look at that. Look where that pitch was done. Yeah, the breaking pitch up over the plate. Look at that ball hooking away from Lohenstein. He had no chance whatsoever. Then skipping through the mud and off the wall. The biggest thing you could do then was run it down. So Garner's at second base, and here's Manny Sanguian. And we told you about the Bucks' ability to play catch-up baseball. They did it all year long. In the late innings, they can terrify it. There's not a weak spot in their lineup. That is to Belanger on a couple of hops as he will throw Sangian out. Now Garner has to remain at second base, and we go to the top of the order on Omar Moreno. He is 0 for 2 tonight. He's bounced to second, and he's lined to center. Baltimore has a history of these angular shortstops with a kind of antelope lope. After all, Belanger came after Ron Hanson. Here is Omar Moreno. And there is Mrs. Moreno. Trying to get something started with the whistle. <laughs> Come on, sweetie, you can do it. <laughs> she knows the folks heard her. <laughs> Well, he's done it all year. He's had a fine year. 282, eight home runs, 69 RBIs, 77 stolen bases. And as we've said, he can make this club go. The third baseman, Doug DeSensei, up on the grass. He's going to take away a bunt situation from Moreno if he's going to come that way. DeSensei, after the pitch, he will take a step in and then a step back quickly to third. Belanger in a little bit of an awkward position. Now here's Dempsey. Here's what I mean where he will take over. He will come in. He will make sure that he has got everything squared away with Flanagan. He wants to make sure he knows exactly what's on your mind. The sensei will double check with him. Belanger's got to keep Garner close at second base. Billy Smith is back at, uh, se at his second base position. So that means Belanger's got to move over a little bit. Tanner, he'll turn him loose at any time. <laughs> That's that pitch. Good off-speed breaking pitch. Beautiful. 0-2 to Moreno. Moreno's led the National League in stolen bases the last couple of years. a nasty pitch left hander to left hander as he dropped from the side. Rick took a quick look at New Decker behind the plate. Well no solace there. A ball and two strikes one out one on five to one Baltimore. Good curve ball. The fourth strikeout for Flanagan tonight. And as you look at it again, it came at a big time. He pitched Moreno beautifully. First the changeup, got him on a swinging strike, and then the curveball. And here is the little contact hitter, Timmy Foley. Well, you see, Foley one for two. He's flying to left, single and scored. The only pirate run of the night, that was in the fourth inning. There you see a Foley up on that bat handle. He's up about four inches. One and oh. This is a feisty kid who's taught himself all the subtle skills of the game. How to advance the runs. How to hit inside out. How to hit and run. He's given a lot of credit to former manager Gene Mock. One and one the count. Mock told him early in his career, Tim, you're never going to be a star. Forget it. He said at first that discouraged him. Then he came to realize Mock was exactly right. Mark's had a great influence upon him. Foul right side, one and two the count. <laughs> Elrod <laughs> Hendricks <laughs> with a face warming mask. <laughs> Ellie will be remembered forever for a brief stint as a pitcher in Toronto a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think he's putting on a little bit for that. <laughs> Now 
Uh, Foley fighting off that curveball, fouling it over in the Baltimore dugout. Count remains one and two, two outs, corner at second base. I'm talking about Gene Mark, uh, Howard. I tell you, Gino has influenced a lot of young people in the game of baseball. Sure. He really has. He recognized Foley was the same kind of ball player Gino was. That's right. And Gino was a disciple of the late Branch Rickey, and Mr. Rickey early spotted Gino as a potentially an outstanding manager, which he is. Big hop to Desense. Gets the handle and throws him out. Now the Pirates are gone in the fifth inning, and after four and a half, it remains Baltimore five and Pittsburgh one. Now we're back. Here in Baltimore, with the Orioles on top, five to one. Just about everybody getting into the act. There's the Oriole here in Baltimore, and we have the third Pittsburgh pitcher of the evening. It'll be Enrique Romo coming on. Romo, just prior to going to the mound, he made sure that he walked into home plate umpire Jerry Newdecker, and Newdecker was telling him, he said, "Now, no, you can't go with your fingers to your mouth." Romo then gestured, "Can I blow on my hand?" He said, "Yes." But don't put your fingers in your mouth. Meanwhile, Romo is a pitcher of whom pitching coach Harvey Haddix is especially fun. He throws just about everything and has a remarkable screwball that goes straight down. In the meantime, there's du Doogie DeSensei, who'll be coming up this inning, who's had the two run homer. I spoke with him earlier. Doogie. You're finally coming out of the shadow of Brooks Robinson. You can see it happening and feel it, can't you? Well, uh, you know, when you make a play like the one that I did, it, it's uh, it's important, and everybody across the nation is watching it, and then everybody starts remembering the fact that in 1970, Brooks made all those fantastic plays. And uh, I guess it does remove that little bit of a shadow. Well, they've got the shadow right now. Duck DeSensei at third base here in Baltimore, and he's going to be a fixture there for quite a while. It'll be Murray Lowenstein and DeSensei. As you look at Enrique Romo, make Romo a record of 10 and 5 on the year. He made 84 appearances. That's one thing about Chuck Tanner. He used that bullpen. You had Romo with 84. You had Tacovi with 94. And Grant Jackson was 72. Romo, he was acquired from the Seattle Mariners with Rick Jones. They sent a fine young shortstop over there, Mario Mendoza, and also Odell Jones, a pitcher, Rafael Vasquez. That was in December of 78. And now you see what Weaver has. He gets to have Murray come up, and he'll turn around and hit the other way. And he won for one tonight. He walked and scored and sink. Well, what you have to look for with Romo is that remarkable screwball that Harvey Haddock loves to talk about. He said, I've never seen one like it anywhere. I tell you, it goes straight down. Well, he <laughs> he'll throw you everything but the kitchen sink every now and then. Now Murray stands in as we get ready to go to the Baltimore fifth, five to one Baltimore. Because it goes straight down is another reason New Decker told him to keep his fingers <laughs> out of his mouth. Drysdale, an expert on the subject. <laughs> I stayed breaking fits. <laughs> There's a Baltimore fan. And you know that they're happy. Baltimore, they really picked up some fan reaction here. I was talking to Brooks Robinson during the playoff series, and he said, They've had great fans here in Baltimore, but he says for the last year, he said it's been something short of fantastic. Well, it all relates to the year of siege against the Baltimore sports franchises. And then the Baltimore News American Drive, the motto on every bumper sticker you can see, the birds belong in Baltimore. That's what they call them here, not the Orioles, as it says on the jersey, but the birds. Romo moving him back with that breaking pitch, and that's been their slogan there. The bird will fly. And they're going to have to fly in a hurry after game two tomorrow night on to Pittsburgh. No off day. Rain took care of that yesterday. This is maybe one of the few fastballs that you'll see Romo throw. Yeah, but he threw it almost out of the ballpark, too. <laughs> 
They're going to let Murray get a hold of it. I looked up this morning, woke up pretty early, and looked out the window, saw that snow coming down. I got up, went out in the hall, got the paper to make sure I was in Baltimore. <laughs> I'm not so serious, it happened overnight. Well, I tell you, those were big flakes, too. Oh, wow. There it is. There's the Scroogey. That's a little low on the count three and one. Who was the best screwball pitcher you ever saw? Well, Ruben Gomez had a pretty good one. Oh, he sure did. How about a fellow named Warren Spahn? Oh, he had an excellent one. He is. If that man hadn't been in World War II, he would have had 400 career victories. He misses and Murray walks. Tried to bring that breaking pitch from the outside in. Mike Marshall didn't have a bad one either, Howard. And still there. Now well, Johnny Lowenstein comes on. He was on on the big air by Garner in the first inning. That accounted for a couple of runs. He later came on to score and he struck out, so he's 0 for 2. But along with that, the one RBI. Romo certainly no stranger, as we mentioned before. He was with Seattle, so Baltimore knows a little bit about Romo. One and oh. Here's a case where you look at Weaver and you know that you got Romo who does not throw a lot of fastballs. He tried to sneak that one by Johnny Lowenstein. And with a score five one and even though you have that hole open on the first base side but you've got good speed in Murray and he's out of the green light. It. And Romo knows that. Here's a case sometimes where you with speed you take away the best pitch from the pitcher and that is Romo's screwball. Lowenstein fighting that Scroogey off the count one and one. Baltimore five runs on five hits as you look at Earl Weaver in the Baltimore dugout. Well that's quite a career record. <laughs> and he has a good time doing it. He's a good solid baseball man. Fly ball center field Moreno. That is out number one. Now with one out and Murray at first base that'll bring on Doug DeSensei who homered his first time at bat and he walked in the third so he's one for one. And has a couple of RBI's. Remember what we said early in the telecast about the unexpected ones so often being World Series heroes. Of course, we're only in game one and it's very early. But this is the kind of guy who doesn't have the big stats going into the series who can kill you. And in this first game, he is thus far, apart from possibly Mike Flanagan, the outstanding player with his two run home run. We're through four and a half. There you can see a little bit better as far as that dirt and mud going along in shallow left center field. Oh and one he went with a breaking pitch. Bottom of the fifth game one of the 1979 World Series and both those three airs underneath that E for Pittsburgh have been well, two of them been mighty big. Pretty good move that time by Romo. All he does is drop that left leg back and he's got a pretty quick move over there. One ball one strike to count. The sensei with a big hole to shoot through on that right side. Garner cheating over towards the bag a little bit at his second base position. Of course, Stargell, there you see the hole. And Stargell holding Murray at first base. Two balls and a strike. He had him set up for that pitch, didn't he? And he let it get an outside. 
DeSensei, you know, it's interesting to watch his stance. He just lays that bat right on the right shoulder. He says, all right, I'm ready. aware of the speed that Eddie Murray possesses at first base. Baltimore and Romo taking too much time as the sensei will back out. Get a guy that has all those pitches and he starts shaking you off is trying to it's hard to figure out which one he wants to throw, especially if he wants to decoy once in a while. That breaking pitch, and he hung it. The sensei a little unhappy with himself. Is he a little bit like a younger Louis Tiant? Louis will make you white. He'll make you wait a little bit. He doesn't have that kind of stair step stretch coming down where he just kind of bounce, 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 bounce like Tion does. But he'll make you wait a little bit. He is not the fastest worker in baseball. You can say that. Two balls, two strikes. Little looper, and it could be trouble. Parker will be there. And he just about slipped as he made the catch. Now Murray second at first base, base, two outs, base. and the second baseman Billy Smith comes on. I'd love to have a sound mic on Parker's shoes out there in right field. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a warmer night, the frogs would be croaking. <laughs> You know that he's got to be sloshing around. Yeah, but I tell you, the beating this thing has taken. They've had five football games here. The weather just hammered Three of them in the rain, Keith. And it's uh, it's incredible they could even get it in this good of shape. They really have worked their tail off. That is how the birds picked up a big five in the first inning. There goes Murray. There's the strike, and forget about it. Nikoja could not find the handle, and Murray has a stolen base standing up. Billy Smith, he is just tickled to death to be in this series. He said, you know, he said it's like a kid in Wonderland. I guess that could be true. I guess for everybody that's been in a World Series a time or two, or even the first time, especially the first time. And especially a young man who really isn't going to be a regular for somebody. But, you know, if fortune has it, now they're going to put him on. So he can one of these days tell his grandchildren they walk me intentionally. And of course the reasoning behind that you've got the right hand hitter Rick Dempsey standing right behind him. Yeah but Rick is a dangerous hitter despite his low batting stance. This Baltimore team loves you. They really do. Don't they do. They it's a funny club. If you watch him enough during the course of the year after a while you sit back and say well yeah he says I, I know I know they've won. I know they've won 102 games. Eddie Murray, the reason Garner was over there, just making sure that Murray wasn't going to get too far off the bat. But the thing about Baltimore, they, they, they don't have a lot of sensational players. They've got good, steady, everyday players. They play Earl Weaver baseball. They play sound, fundamental baseball. But they've got great pitching. And they just don't beat themselves. And they're a team. And they are a team. And he goes through everybody. Here's Dempsey. He is 0 for 2. Lined to short and bounced to second. 0 and 1 on a breaking pitch. He it's... might like to have that pitch back. That yes. was up a touch. Up a touch. Got a slider over the plate. 0 and 1. Here's a guy here that you don't pay attention to him, and he's going to hurt you with it. A big key double here in the very first game against the Angels in the playoff series. Hit it off the piping in left field. Murray at second. 
And Billy Smith at first. Yeah. You could see the difference in the thinking right there. Romo shaking his head. Nikosia wanted it down and away, and he got it up over the head of Dempsey. That earned run average, Haddox will tell you, is totally deceptive for the last 23 games. He's appearing in. Two balls and a strike. You see, Romo really doesn't like as you look at Murray at second base. And at first base, Billy Smith, hands in the back pocket, trying to keep him warm. Doesn't like to give you that fastball to hit. He'll show it to you to try and set up the curveball, the slider, or the screwball. That is not his best pitch. That's about his third best pitch. Slider low. Three and one. Let me tell you something about Rick Dempsey. He started hitting pretty well in the late season. And he attributes it to Coach Jim Fry, who had him close his stance. So many hitters find at least temporary advantages out of a change of batting stance. Of course, the great ones adjust according to the pitcher, like Rod Carew, who's got four basic stances. Dempsey's not in that kind of hitting class, of course, but he can hurt you in the clutch. Full count now three and two and with two outs the runners will be going Murray from second base and Billy Smith from first it's five to one Baltimore we're in the bottom of the fifth you see Billy Smith talking with his first base coach Jimmy Fry How about Jimmy Fry one of the rumors and good Lord uh, with all the gathering of baseball people this time of the year there are a million rumors I don't know if there's been a substitute at all but a lot of talk that Jim Fry might get the call to go to Kansas City as manager. It's a pretty good ball club to inherit. <laughs> Runners go. That's Luke Foul. Well, the count remains full. Three balls, two strikes, two outs, two on. Beginning with George Brett. Yeah, how'd you like to inherit George Brett? <laughs> Excuse me, I did, <clears throat> did a show with him over the weekend at Pepperdine University. He had been out hunting with Whitey Herzog, the deposed manager. He's in great shape, by the way. He said, I came too late, hit 329. He said, I should have hit 350 this year. Runners go again, and he pops him up in shallow left field. There is Robinson, and that is out number three. Well, Baltimore is gone. They lead it five to one through five, and we'll be back with more baseball after this word from our local station. Now Mike Flanagan starting inning number six and had a chance to talk with Mike a little bit. There's his record about the hitters that really concerned him on the Pittsburgh Pirate Club and this is what he had to say. Now you've studied the scouting reports on the Pittsburgh lineup. You find yourself thinking mainly about Parker and Stargell or do you feel you have a big edge against them because you're a southpaw and you're more concerned about Matlock. Actually, I am more concerned about the right-handed hitters. Uh, uh, Left-handers, I usually pitch more or less the same way, but the right-handers, uh, Madlock and uh, Bill Robinson especially, gave me some trouble this spring. So I'm, I'm more concerned about the right-hand hitters, and I'll try to pitch my same, same game against the lefties. Well, so far, he's allowed the Pirates to run on four hits. And here in the sixth inning. And so far, this man is two for right. two, That's the lefty. Right. That's right. It'll be Parker, Robinson, and Stargell. Steve Stone up in the bullpen for Baltimore now. Parker, he doubled his first time at bat and singled his second time at bat. First time, it's interesting. There you see Steve Stone. He had a fine year. Well, we saw him pitch at Dandy in Milwaukee. Yes, sir. We really did. One of the biggest games of the year. It's One the game hitter. that put Milwaukee out of things. There's three for three for Parker. <laughs> as Bumbry will play it on a hopper. Boy, I tell you what a ball player this guy is. He is just great. Let's watch his swing. He got so hot at the end of the year, he had a five-hit game in the final series, as you saw that. Describe that swing. Back. Yeah, to me, it's, it's really kind of a picture swing. He didn't have a big stride, very short and quick, and then, boom, his hands took over. He's got to be strong, as we mentioned before, swinging at 37, 37 bat. It's 37 inches, 37 ounces. Here's Robinson. 
One ball, no strikes. Robinson 0 for 2 has struck out and bounced to third. Here's another guy that can hurt you with just one swing of the bat. 24 home runs on the year and 75 RBIs. Good change. <laughs> That's the pitch we told you about at the start of the game. You heard Mike Flanagan himself describe it. It's the pitch that made him, as he said it, a four pitch pitcher instead of a two pitch pitcher. It's the pitch that made him a complete pitcher. Another change, and it's bounced foul by Joe Lynette. Well, Parker has to go back, and the count moves to one and two. David had that big five hit game against the Cubbies in the final series of the regular season. That's when he was going with the pitch to left when it was outside. He was hitting inside out. Now here against the South Boys at everything to right. Well that'll change his scouting report a little bit hard if you start looking at that and say well wait a minute this guy's going the other way. Just trying to pick up some singles here and drive in some runs. So they've tried to jam him a few times and he had just come up to the occasion. There's a jam job and that's a good one too. One and two the count. At the same time Don there are certain pitches that will ignore scouting reports as you look at this again. Uh, he gets that pitch right in a little half swing check swing there by Robinson. Well the pitcher still has to pitch his own game. That's right. That's the point. Can't go away from your strengths. Kent to Colby, for instance. He throws one way. He throws out all the scouting reports. At age 15, growing up in Cincinnati, they already called him the whip. He throws like you will Blackwell. And he throws that loop to right, and that's going to be a base hit. As Singleton gets on it in a hurry, and Parker has to stop at second base, so all of a sudden the Bucks have got something going here in the sixth inning. The one thing about a scout report for a pitcher is you can't put circumstances on a piece of paper. That's the problem. Now the Bucks on top of the Baltimore Orioles in the hit department 6-5, but with three errors for Pittsburgh, Baltimore on top in the run department 5-1 as Willie Stargell comes on. And here they are chopping back. Well, they're just one big swing of the bat in this guy from being right back in it. Stoddard's also working in the bullpen for the birds. Good off speed curveball. There's Stoddard, the big guy on the left side, and left hander Tippy Martinez on the right side of your screen. Stoddard is huge. He's the Radads type. <laughs> was a power forward in the basketball. That's group. right. Stargell over two tonight has struck out and bounced a second. Drop right from the side. Oh, and to the count. Notice no batting gloves to start. With. That is a rarity today. There's Chuck Tanner. Good oh, speed curveball. He has really pitched Willie beautifully. Strikeout number five. And the second time he's gotten Willie. Look at it again. Comes by way of first base. He's taken just enough off of it, and Stargell has already committed himself. Here's Madlock. Bounce the third and walk. Loop to right center, but Singleton coming on in a hurry and makes the catch. Now Parker has to stay at second base and Robinson at first base. On that turf, that was not an easy play. No, it wasn't. I'll guarantee you Earl Weaver took a deep gulp down in that dugout. Kenny had to go all out and risk that a spikes would hold. The chief groundskeeper told us the spikes would hold. Dave Parker has had trouble in that area tonight with the spikes. But for Kenny and Frank Robinson right there, motioning to his outfielders where to play. Made a pretty good pitch on Mal. He got that pitch in on him. He had to kind of inside out that ball a little bit. Don Robinson throwing in the bullpen for Pittsburgh. That's a fireballer. Throws bullets. 
Uh, while they have a little chat at the mound, Nikosia will go back and grab the pine tar rag. Two outs, two on, five to one Baltimore. We're in the top of the sixth. Robinson's one of those guys. He's got to use his strengths. He's got to pitch his game as you look at it. Same thing as I was saying with Tekulvi. The whip like on, the buggy whip on, everything low. He's got good stuff. If he's healthy, that's the key to Robinson this year. Nikojo for two tonight. Hit hard and look out foul. Well, Flanagan had the first two men on singles by Parker and Robinson. He struck out Scargill and got Madlock to fly to right. Good change. And you saw how far Nikoji was out in front. One ball, one strike. That's Parker at second base. Still, Flanagan's been flirting with trouble. First two men on as you look at Robinson on first. Walker on second, last inning. Donna got him for a double to open the inning. It can catch up to you. Change inside and the count two and one. See that breath, Flanagan. It is chilling. 86 pitches by Flanagan so far. Three and one. Murray trying to slip in behind Robinson at first base. Garner in the on deck circle. And there he is. He's the man who doubled. Open the fifth. Hit to the hole. This sensei boots the ball, picks it up, and can't make a play. Parker goes to third. The second base is Robinson, and the Pirates have the bases loaded. Well, we'll see how they score that as you take another peek at it. Tough play. The ball really didn't it hung up in the air for a long time and forced Doug into the position of having to short hop it. But they're going to give him an error. He deserved it. Now that's what you get after they watch you make great plays all the time. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Now's the chance for Garner to really atone for that first inning error that opened the door to DeSensei's two run home. This is the first Baltimore fielding mistake, the one you just saw. And let's see if the Pirates can capitalize. Good fastball for a strike. 89 miles an hour. They clock it. Lee Lacey down in the on deck circle. And that is a good pinch hitter, the former Dodger. Good off speed curveball. There's Mrs. Garner. Who do you think she is in pulling? What a beautiful change of speed pitch. Garner closed the regular season with a 14 game hitting streak and now the fans come alive here in Baltimore the two strikes they look for the strikeout look out and a great save by Dempsey how about that that had uh, backstop all over it didn't it oh this was it look at it again this is a truly exceptional play tried to take a little bit off of that breaking pitch inside and bounce it down at the feet and that is a tough play for a catcher but look the way Dempsey plays Wild pitch written all over. Inside. Vision obscured by the batter to some degree. The body not able to get behind the ball. And yet the use of the glove to block it. Well, the fans still, they look for the strikeout. Desense, and it's foul. <laughs> Hands on their feet. Oh, hey, right there, he, he really tried to decoy Terry Tater, didn't he? He yeah, did. got in between Tater yeah. and the ball, yeah, too. It's beautifully position. done. <laughs> the man could become an actor. Watch this. He got right in front of Beautiful the pickup, too. <laughs> That's one of the things. Look at that backhanded pickup. You talk about soft hands. 
Next week, he gets the Joe Namath role in Picnic in Akron, Ohio. Now they call time as they move the golf cart out in the Pittsburgh bullpen. They usually move that golf cart back and forth. They bring the pitchers in and they switch usually. And they ought to get two of those cards. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh oh, that's foul, and he hung himself a little mm -hmm. off speed curveball, and Garner was not fooled that much. A ball and two strikes with two outs, bases loaded, 5 1 Baltimore. Garner is a tough player. There's Parker at third, Robinson at second, and at first base, that is Steve Nicosia. And he's a tough player because he's played tough with the Oakland A's. Shake him around in the Baltimore dugout. When they had that great old gang in Oakland. Well, it appeared when they had that great old gang, Howard, that when he took over for Dick Green, that they were going to stay with that great old gang. But By the way, there's another of those unsung world here, uh, series heroes, That's Dick right. Green. That's right. A ball, two strikes. How do you like that figure? That's the one we mentioned earlier. Hit hard, base hit, left field. Here comes Parker. Here comes Robinson. Lowenstein will bring it back to third base, and all of a sudden it is five to three Baltimore with the tying runs aboard. They keep coming back, and certainly Ghana has a tone. I'll tell you, he just fights that slider off of him and hits it to the hole, and now that will bring out Earl Weaver. Lowenstein has no play. Johnny just makes a good play to get in front of the ball and get it back in. So Weaver. We'll talk to Flanagan and Dempsey. You've had Stoddard, you've had Stone, and now you're getting what, Tippy Martinez up in the bullpen. So there have been three pitchers out of the Baltimore pen, but Earl just stomps a little bit, and tries to jack up Flanagan and leaves it. Staying with Mike. In the meantime, as you look at Gauna, as he got that hit, and you look back through the years with Phil. The way produces in the clutch is Lee, Lee Lason. Lason. Told you earlier he was on deck, the ex Dodger. That's the kid, Phil Garner, right there. He likens this Pirates team or clubhouse to the way it used to be in Oakland. Oh, and one to Lacey, who hit 247 on the year with five home runs and 15 RBIs. Now the Pirates trying to fight back. The time runs aboard. Oh, he's grown accustomed to this pace. He's the only man in baseball who's played in the last three World Series. That's right. With the Dodgers for the last two years and now this year with the Bucks. Paycheck's getting to be a habit. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of likes it. It's like Bob Fleming used to be in the Super Bowls. <laughs> <laughs> That's bounce foul. Joe Lynette will make the play. Lacey coming to the Pirates in the reentry free agent draft this year. Fleming used to have an answering service. Le that left a message at his home. Have gone to play for the season. Reach me after the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> no balls, two strikes to Lee Lacey. Two outs, two on. Five to three Baltimore. We're in the top of the six. Desense bobbles the ball. Does he make the play? No, and he can't make the tag. So two errors by Doug Desense here in the sixth inning has given the Pirates the light. And how quickly the shifting tides of fortune can change. There you look at it again, and the ball, actually the ball, Doug let the ball play him. The ball came up on him, then he misses the tag. And then the coach just about slides by the bag and he almost gets him coming back as you take another peek at it. Talk about the brilliance of his defensive play. You give him the edge over Matt Locke and fielding for that brilliance. You talk with him about his great play to save the series against the Angels. And just then he comes up with two errors that have led to the Bucks two runs thus far in this inning. There's Moreno with the bases loaded. Good fastball, and he had something on that on pitch number 100. There's Omar's 
wife again. <laughs> Come on, sweetie. He's rooting too. Guess what? He's going to get called the rest of his career. <laughs> <laughs> Pops him up. Bumbry right there. And that is out number three. So the Bucks are gone, but they pick up a couple of runs. And after five and a half, it is five to three, Baltimore. That's Phil Garner. I talked about the Oakland clubhouse, the Pittsburgh clubhouse. He's been in both. I talked with him about that. Would you contrast for me the atmosphere in the Oakland clubhouse when they were in their heyday with the atmosphere in this current Bucks clubhouse? A lot of similarities. Of course, there is the same free-spirited uh, atmosphere. There's a lot of jovial kidding, a lot of jiving back and forth, a lot of games being played against ball players. I think there's a certain amount of camaraderie that we have uh, among our teammates here that we certainly had in Oakland. But I think the big thing, uh, the two big things are, we had a great leader in Oakland in Sal Bando. We have a great leader in this clubhouse in the Will Stargell. But uh, another great uh, similarity between the two clubs is that although we kid around in the clubhouse a lot and sometimes uh, we get angry at each other, but once we put that uniform on, we're, we're strictly professional. We have one thing in mind, that's to go out and win a ball game. Now the words of Phil Garner. He drove in a couple in the sixth inning for Pittsburgh to make it five to three Baltimore and you're looking at Don Robinson. He is the fourth Pirate pitcher. We said before <laughs> Chuck Tanner will go through that staff if he has to. He'll try and hold you wherever he can. Robinson on the year he only relieved four times. He started 25 times a record of eight and eight and a three eight six ERA as he will face Flanagan the bottom of the order and then we'll go to the top of the order in Bunbury and Belanger in the championship series Robinson got a save and a victory but he's had problems with a sore right shoulder this year. Oh he can fire about. Oh, oh he can throw you hate to see a young man like that that can throw the way he can throw and he just threw that first one 93 miles an hour a good breaking pitch. Two and oh. He's a great big old strong guy born in Ashland Kentucky lives now in Canova West Virginia he's 6'4", 230 pounds. Two balls and a strike the count He's only 22. He can turn it loose. I'll say one thing about Flanagan. He's got he a swing. Get yeah. cheated. <laughs> For a guy who hasn't hit in how many years? Oh, I don't know. But, you know, that was one of the things they talked about, uh, Mike Flanagan. You, you two guys brought it up a little bit earlier that he can swing the bat a little bit. He yeah. hasn't actually hit for himself since 1975, and I guess that was down at <laughs> Rochester. They were laughing here and had stories in the paper about the pitchers, the Baltimore pitchers getting them ready to hit. Somebody, I think, made the right statement when they said, you know, it's kind of like riding a bicycle once you learn how. And if you can do it all right, well, you really never forget. Good swing, but he strikes out. You know, you look at this ball game in perspective, you can see how quickly the ebb and flow can change. In the first inning, DeSensei with the two-run home run, the hero. Then DeSensei with the two errors, the goat. In the first inning, Ghana with the big error, the goat. But now Ghana with those two runs driven in and two hits in his last two at-bats coming on, making up for the mistake of the first inning. Now that will bring on Bumbry. Well, well, this program is being brought to you as an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Now let's pause five seconds to allow our local stations to identify themselves. Owen oh, Wondell. He is one for two tonight with a run score. There's that good breaking pitch. Owen oh, to the count. To Foley, he's got to go, and they get him. 
Two gone. And this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and is intended solely for the private non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or the use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Major League Baseball is prohibited. I'm glad you finally got to read that. <laughs> He's been waiting all season. <laughs> the big thrill. There's two gone, and here's Mark Belanger. Meanwhile, Look out. as usual, the Twin D got us some runs. Yep. We've got a tough, tight ball game now. And a typical Pittsburgh ball game. Coming back, coming back, and the relief is holding on. A ball and a strike to Belanger. He's 0 for 2, but he walked in the first and scored a run. That was an unearned run. The uh, Birds have not had a hit for three and two thirds innings. That again is a little bit of a trait of Baltimore. They'll sometimes they'll sneak up on you in a hurry. Then all of a sudden they'll throw some leather and good pitching at you. And most of the time that will be enough. But you're in the World Series now. You're playing the best of the other league. And yet, and yet in perfect truth, errors have led to all of the scores. Three errors for the Bucks, two for the Birds. A ball and two strikes to Belanger. Oh. Just missed. <laughs> yeah, she Look. says, hanging in there. Two hops to Foley. Low and Stargell a good play to dig it out. And Baltimore gone one, two, three here in the sixth inning. Three up, three down. There you look at it one more time. Foley stayed back now. He sees the big hop. And now in the dirt to Stargell. And the big guy stays right with it, makes a good play. So after six, five, three, Baltimore. That's the story from Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. Game one of the 1979 World Series. I'm Don Drysdale, Keith Jackson, Howard Cosell. As we go to the seventh, and once again, here's Keith. And we look to Tim Foley, the Pirate shortstop to lead it off. Parker's on deck. Robinson will follow. 5-3 ball game as Flanagan pitches, and it's rolled to Belanger. And that thing is a little bit like a hot potato, isn't it? But that's exactly why Earl Weaver is playing Mark Belanger in this, the first game of the 79 World Series. Look at the antelope. That is not an easy play for Belanger. That ball's hit pretty good, but... Well, I don't know how many Golden Gloves he's had, but I'll tell you one thing, that's exactly why he makes it. Look a little bit like Mr. Marty Mary. A little bit. Dave so. Parker, three for three. Double, single, single, score to run. The only home run in the ball game by DeSense for two runs in the first inning when Baltimore did all the scoring. No win. Big swing, change, and it's strike one. We told you right at the top of the game that the Bucks do well against Southpaws. It is like Parker, let's face it, can hit anybody. Tap toward the sensei. Doug comes and throws and gets him. Two down. Now there's the first time that Flanagan tonight has gone to the off speed pitches to Parker. The other three times he went to the hard stuff and he said, Well, Mr. Dave, you made a believer out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, on Saturday at 3.30 Eastern, Oklahoma and Texas out of the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Freddie Akers horns undefeated, Barry Switzer Sooners undefeated, featuring the Heisman Trophy winner Billy Sims, and Bill Robinson hits it high in the air to right field, where Ken Singleton waits. Calls off Al Bumbley and makes the catch, and so very quickly Flanagan retires the Pirates at the top of the seventh. And the score remains 5 3 Baltimore. We'll go to the bottom of the seventh inning now. John Denver's uh, country boy music in the background of the crowd standing and taking their seventh inning stretch, Don Robinson. 
He's out on the mound for Pittsburgh. He'll be working to Ken Singleton, Eddie Murray, and John Lowenstein. He's got a flamethrower on the mound, and you've got big guys coming to the plate who love to jump on the hard stuff. Robinson pitched two innings of the National League Championship Series. He got a save and a victory, but he still has a bit of a problem with a sore right shoulder. Doesn't bother him going an inning or two, but get beyond that sometimes, and it grabs him. And he's had a whole bunch of x-rays already on that shoulder, trying to figure out exactly what... More than 30. Hmm. More than 30. If he's going to have trouble, it would seem to be against Singleton and Murray and Lowenstein. Singleton goes back over to the other side of the plate, being a switch hitter, and he takes strike one, and Robinson certainly not backing down. He came right at him with a bullet. Pulls a string on one and misses, and it's one and one. Those of you who have joined us a little late, we'll tell you in just a moment as the pitch is inside the single and just how it all happened. Pittsburgh jumped out in front by a score of 5 nothing, getting five runs, and there were errors of commission as well as omission in that first inning by Pittsburgh, enabling Baltimore to get the big five. But the Pirates came back with one in the fourth and two more in the sixth, and that's where we are at 5 3. Don Robinson is the fourth pitcher for Pittsburgh. Keese has started, did not get out of the first inning. Rooker followed, pitched well, then Romo for an inning, and now Robinson. And the count is three and one to Ken Singleton. The temperature is in the 30s, and it's fouled away. Of course, the weather is one of uh, five or six things that mankind can't do much about. Welcome to the Winter Olympics. <laughs> Playing conditions are the same for both sides. Three two pitch. Ball four. Now the bird fans come alive. They know there's a flamethrower out there. They know Murray's a fastball hitter. Remember, he's had 25 home runs, 99 runs batted in. Tonight he's one for one, the single game when he was batting right-handed. Yeah, sign, the mood of the fans all speaking for themselves. Again, for those of you who might have joined us late, Louis Kuhn decided at 524 after traversing the field with the head groundskeeper that this game could be played. The field looks at points choppy, but Everyone was assured that the risk of injury was minimal, if at all. Murray stands in, also switching around. Something comes. Yeah, I don't know whether that was padding, the sponge or yeah, it was, part of the sponge of Nikosia just popped out to the right side. I, I was <laughs> looking for Singleton to go to second base. I was too. I it was the ball. <laughs> That's how hard Robinson throws. He's exploding the glove. He just knocked the back the padding right out of his glove. Murray's the kind of hitter who can send Singleton home in a hurry. Especially against this kind of pitch. Yeah. They give uh, Eddie left center. In the outfield defense. And he took his cut and it's two strikes. He got it by him. Well, I'll guarantee if Nikoji was sitting back thinking about a little cat nap with that foul tip that got him right dead center of the mask. Yes, he's back in the ball game. Now. <laughs> he's back in the ball game, right? <laughs> Notice the paraphernalia he's wearing, a la Steve Yeager. That's right. That's to keep the foul tip from moving up underneath the chest protector and getting in the Adam's apple or in the throat. Lordy, how would you like to have that happen oh, on a night like this? Don't even think about it. Whoa. A foul tip on a night like this. Two strike and Murray feeling that Robinson had taken too long steps out on him. There you see the way that he will hold the ball. He throws up over the top and he'll hold it across that seam right there and he gets it up and that ball's going to ride on you. It'll take off. Punch foul left side going to the crowd. They came out tonight. The umpires this afternoon were early. They knew the Inclement conditions might require a large number of baseballs. They rubbed ten dozen. You might add too, as we had that shot of Robinson, 
you hold that ball behind you or that first base coach and take a look at you. If you should change on different pitches, you better change in your glove. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they will pick it up. Two strike pitch to Murray with Singleton on first base, and it's just outside. Play at first as Singleton steps back in. The Stars are holding the inside corner with a left handed batter at the plate. Garner is pulled halfway down. Parker is deep and right, respecting the power of Eddie Murray. One two pitch misses, and it's two and two. You know, Howard, you were talking about the field and the condition that it's in right now, and a lot of people might be wondering, well, you heard us talk about the infield was covered, but the outfield has not been covered. That's the Orioles' first inning, how they scored the five runs. But I think we should, they probably are thinking, well, why is it? Why didn't they cover the outfield? Well, it can be covered. The only problem being with all the rain that they had yesterday, if they would have covered the field and then say the rain might have stopped a half an hour or so before game time, the groundskeeper here in Baltimore says that's fine. I can do that. The only problem is it takes me four hours to take the tarp off. <laughs> <laughs> the 2 2 pitch to Murray. Fouled away. Count holds right there at two. That's Kenny Singleton going back to first base. When they go over to Pittsburgh, they go on to the rug. That will make a difference. Well, that's also as much as you talk about the artificial surface, that is one thing that is a help when you have that kind of weather that they had yesterday. Of course, that chant in the background is Andy, Andy. Fly ball to center field. Marino loops around and settles, makes the catch, one out, singled, and goes back to first base. He changed up on that. That was not the fireball. It's a good pitch. Don good pitch. Here comes Big John Lowenstein. We have 254 on the year. There are the numbers tonight. He's done a little bit of everything for Earl Weaver's ball club this year. He's pinch hitter, pinch runner, played all three outfield positions, filled in a couple of times at first and third, and one time he played all three outfield positions in the same game this past season. You got one out and single it on first and Robinson's fastball finds the target for strike one. Ninety four miles an hour. Ooh. I was going to say he had something on that pitch. What would you feel like Don if you stuck one of those in on the handle. And this cold right there out on the it's end of the back have some harmony in your body wouldn't you. Ooh. That's outside. Just take off the batting glove and just check all fingernail that's all. <laughs> You go stick it in a bucket of hot water. That's, That's right. the fastest ball thrown tonight. That one, 96 miles per hour. It's great to be 22. Mm. That's right. That's close pitch, but it missed. And it's two and one. Not the only thing you could think about Don Robinson as far as velocity is concerned, comparing him. Well, these Baltimore boys just watching them and trying to compare them with somebody in the American League. You'd have to think fastball or velocity wise is Nolan Ryan or Jim Kern. Two one pitch. Foul back. It's even at two. You know the thing that you hate to see too when you talk about 22 years of age. There's a story tomorrow right here from Memorial Stadium. Game two eight o'clock Eastern then. The scene shifts to Three River Stadium game three on Friday same time eight o'clock Eastern guy 22 years of age you just hate to see that little history of arm problem well, you'd like to see him just stay healthy for about 10 or 12 years and see what he might do and especially one that you can't really define they keep searching for the real problem mm. well, that's, again that's close it's full at three two. Another factor in Lowenstein's favor, one of the reasons that uh, he's an awfully handy guy to have around, he has patience at the plate. 
John's a good steady ball player. Boy, he gives you an honest day's work every time he goes out there. There goes Singleton. The pitch is hit high in the air to the left side. And Bill Robinson, the left fielder, makes the catch. You've got two out. You're watching the sensei now. Watching Lowenstein run off the field. He's limping a little bit, Keith. I just yeah, wonder whether he might have pulled something out there in that outfield line. He might not go out for the next inning with now that he's flied out. He, they might send Renicky out there. Well, one thing is sure, the groundskeeper is not going to get hurt. No. <laughs> Earl's getting a little There's edge. There he is. There's Renicky up. That's exactly what they'll do. Yeah. They'll just go to Renicky right now. And so indication somebody uh, might have been Salvon the Ralph's unborn trainer who touched uh, Lowenstein on his left knee when he came in. So Gary Renicky will get the call. Here's the sensei. He hits the ball hard to right center field. Parker with his dashing speed oh! and his long arms runs it down on one of the best plays of the night. And so. Great catch by Parker. The Orioles are turned away. And we have played seven innings of baseball with Baltimore leading by a score of five to three. And as we watch Parker run it down, he just literally outran the baseball. You see him splashing see that through splash? that footer? That's it. So there we are, and back with more baseball after this word from our local stations. John Lowenstein is in the dugout now. He's out of the ball game, showing some signs of a sore left leg, replacing him in left field, Gary Renicky, who is a fine defensive ball player. And speaking of defense, that play, that inning ending play by Parker, was exactly why we had to give him the edge over Singleton. He saved a run with the play. He has marvelous foot speed, especially for so big a man. As we said, he can do so many things. A superb athlete. Willie Stargell leads off, and Willie Stargell has had his troubles with the lefty Mike Flanagan of the ball game. Struck him out in the second inning, got him on a roller to second base. Though so Willie did deliver a run batted in on that roller. He struck him out again, swinging in the sixth inning. He's been showing him that changeup, and Willie has not handled it. He comes back with a breaking thing that just drops out of sight, and now he's out in front, two strikes. Well, he came into this game troubled. He sent word up to me after I'd gotten to the booth that his room was burglarized last night. So he was robbed of $2,000 and a lot of stereo equipment. And you hate to see that happen to anybody, let alone a man so fine as this. Wire service story just confirmed the information that yes. Willie had sent up to me early. Joe Safety came up earlier and confirmed it as well. Don Stanhouse now cranking up in the bullpen for <laughs> Baltimore. He's going to be a free agent, I guess. He's also sure. a free spirit. <laughs> he is. He, uh, over in the Pittsburgh bullpen now, you have the left-hander Grant Jackson. Jackson, incidentally, was a pitcher for Baltimore back in the 1971 World Series. A one ball and two strike count on Willie Stargell. Now you Sales saw up. you saw the catcher Dempsey. He wanted the breaking pitch, but just before the pitch was thrown, you could see him stick his arm out to the side and say, come out here. Come out here with it. Don't come over the top. Now he wants him over the top. Well, Hit high, high, hard, and good deep, high. and so long. It's a 5-4 ball game. You can get Stargell for a while, but sooner or later. Right now, this game is clearly in the pattern of the Pittsburgh team during the whole second half of the season. Tanner using relief pitcher on relief pitcher. The relief pitchers holding tight. They've gone five and a third innings now, as you look at this again, without allowing a hit to the birds. And then pecking away, pecking away, getting the key hits, given the opportunity. Gone is two run blow, and now starts it. So we've got a one run ball game. Ray Miller is at the pitching mound. The coach, pitching coach of Baltimore, has gone to have a conference with his left-hander. Well, you saw Dempsey. He wanted him over the top, but he just didn't get over the top enough. He got it in between that sidearm breaking pitch and over the top, and he hung it right there. And Willie says, uh-uh, not again. 
Jair Stargell down in the Pittsburgh dugout. 5 4 now. Buccaneers have eight hits in the ball game. Baltimore has been nailed down by this succession of relief pitchers for Pittsburgh, and Bill Metlock stands at the plate and takes strike one. Bill didn't like the call, as you can see. Now, out of the park is Stodgill duo against the Southpaw, the winningest pitcher in the big leagues. Four hits, three for Dave Parker, and the big home run just now by Willie Stodge. Well, you can see that Madlock's a little hot, and he's talking with a man that will give it right back to him. I'll guarantee you that. Jerry Newdecker. He will not take too much. Pitch is low. It's one and one to Madlock. Nicosia is on deck. Then Garner. The ball is hit to center field for Bumbry. One out. Now the pirate catcher Nicosia comes up. He's been on base twice with a double and a single. And was caught looking by Flanagan back in the third. Excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong man. It's Nicosia. I was looking at Garner's stats. He's over three. He was on on that big air, though, by yes, Desense, Keith. Got around the third. That ball is fouled off on the right side and drops into the crowd. Those are winter colors down in that crowd, too, with all the parkas out tonight. <laughs> oh, he really had Nicosia fishing. So Steve strikes out on a bad pitch, and you've got two down. Now well, he gets the change up. He doesn't get it the height that I don't think he wants it, but he has enough off of it outside. And Nicosia, he just can't lay off. And here's the little pepper pot with the two runs batted in in the sixth inning in the clutch after the sensei had opened the door with a big error. And then the sensei made a subsequent error that did not cost at six strikeouts now for Mike Flanagan and he's low to Garner. It'll be Burt by 11 for Pittsburgh tomorrow against Jim Palmer. Not the usual season for Palmer. One ball and one strike now. Lowenstein's problem, sore ankle. Banged it up back on August 9. And he hobbled a bit with it and it took him out of the ball game. Garner swings and misses. Another excellent change. And I would guess that sore ankle by Lowen. I just think that wet turf might, might have yes, just it aggravated. Must have aggravated. That's all it was. I'd like this brings out and makes those little eggs big eggs sometimes too. This insay at third lost it in the lights. You could see that. Some yeah. trying to shield his eyes. Trying to fight it all the way. That'll be a base hit. Now he's trying to side saddle it. It gets up and all of a sudden he's his whoop. It's in the lights. Tries to shade. Tries to side saddle. Get it out of the lights. And he just can't. He cannot do it. It won't come out. Rene Stennett comes out as Chuck Tanner continues to use the bench. There's another look at it, and that's tough. That ball gets in the lights and it won't come out. You try and move to this side. You might you have time. Move to the other side. And at times when it just doesn't come out, Can't that's exactly play. what happened. Doogie feels a little bit snake bit with what's happened to him in the later innings. Stand it at the plate. He can do a lot of things for you, including play pretty solid second base for you. That was his position. With Garner there. No way. 
on a regular basis. A 5-4 ball game here in the top of the eighth inning. Instead, it punches it down into the right field side. It's going to drop in there for a base hit. It drops softly, enabling Garner to make the turn and go to third. And with two out, you have runners at the corner. Now you wonder how long Earl Weaver is going to go with this. A one-run ball game, and the Pirates insistently chopping away at that once big lead. Well, he kind of inside out. Did the you ball see that? Just a Beautiful. Little bit. And he just drops it down in the corner. And of course, Garner with two outs, he's going to be going all the way. He makes it to third easily. They know the arm of Singleton, who got on the ball fairly quickly. And Stennett was not going to be the third out going to second base. And the reason that they will stay with Flanagan right here is because he's lefty. Now, number one, he's won 23 ball games. He's the winningest pitcher in the major leagues, and you've got the left hand hitting Moreno standing at the plate. But he has given up 10 hits, and he's given four of those hits to the left handed hitters. Three to Parker, as we said, and a big home run to Willie Stodgill in this very inning. Moreno 0 for 4 in the ball game. So if you're a Buccaneer fan, you believe in the law of averages. You probably are taking a little hope here. That's fouled away. But that pitch up. Well, you get that pitch up over the plate. <laughs> Going to the whistle this time. Well. <laughs> She's been whistling all night. <laughs> Such faith, I suppose, should be rewarded. The big left-hander out there has got something to say about it. He's in front. He comes outside. The ball again blocked by Dempsey, and it's one and one. Garner at third base, representing the tying run in a 5-4 ball game. And Rennie Stennett at first base. Again in the pattern of this ball game, seizing upon opportunity. That's what the Bucks are trying to do right here because of the ball lost in the lights by Doug DeSensa. Punch foul back in the crowd. That's 125 pitches now for Mike Flanagan. It's a night's work. Now the roar of the crowd as they get caught up in everything. And Mrs. Moreno, she's just kind of saying a little something to herself. And that's the Omar can pick up that tying run. But they get wrapped up, which you've seen in different ballparks this year when you get the count. Two strikes. Good Hold him pitch. out on a curve. So Keith Earl Weaver stuck with his ace. That's a close pitch. Boy, you think this is a nasty pitch. Besides being close, and it is right there. So Flanagan hangs in and gets his man. And we've got a 5-4 ball game in the middle of the eighth inning. Speaking of baseball fever, here's a sample of what it's like in Baltimore in 1979 with Wild Bill Higgy leading the crowd. <laughs> he's a cab driver. Yes, he here is. in Baltimore. And he's got all 53,000 plus people right with him. Brant Jackson comes on now. He is the fifth Pittsburgh pitcher in this ball game. Jackson with a record of eight and five. He was in 72 ball games this past season. He'll be pitching to Billy Smith, Rick Dempsey, and Mike Flanagan, unless Earl Weaver has something going and decides to hit for Flanagan. 5 4 ball game. Baltimore has not done anything with the stick since the second inning. So Grant Jackson, who pitched for Baltimore in 1971, his wife in the crowd, now sitting on the other side. He's a veteran of World Series play. Here is Dower hitting for Smith. Rich Dower comes up to hit for Billy Smith. And will go to second base in the top of the ninth inning. Grant Jackson, the veteran left-hander, to the right-handed Dower, and he's low for ball one.
Now we're on the year. You saw his numbers at 257. And there's a strike. There's the story on the Pittsburgh relief pool tonight, and it's quite remarkable. Well, it really tells the story of the Pittsburgh team the entire second half of the season. How that bullpen core held together. And that pitch is low. You know, it's amazing that how Grant Jackson just keeps on going. He's been blessed with a great arm. He's been in 72 ball games prior to tonight. And he's still going strong. That's fouled out of play. First came up. Yeah, the Philadelphia Phillies. Mm -hmm. That's right. He's kind of a, I've often said he's kind of a left handed Brooks Lawrence, even to a degree, looks like him. You remember? Yes, the I sure full do. Full neck pitcher I with the know. Reds and Cardinals back in the late 50s. That ball is punched up in the crowd on the right side, out of play. Meanwhile, he was a big find for the Yankees. Yeah. In the Kenny Oldsman deal. Sir. Sure. Won six and lost none in relief that year. Made 19 appearances for New York. 76. The 2 2 pitch. Dower looks low. Five four. Baltimore at bat in the bottom of the eighth inning. And it's shot up the middle by Dower. Base hit. He is becoming a very tough out. You're right. He is a typical Baltimore ball player. The kind of guy gets no ink. Look for this pitch here. Yep, reached for it. Shot it into center. But he's gotten a lot of big hits this year. And he's solid in the field. He's matured into a ball player. And just one more of the students and pupils out of USC and Rod Dato's crew. That's right. Kent to Colby. The whip. Look at that delivery. I'm telling you, if you've met him on the street or in the store, you'd never in the world think he was a professional baseball player. Nope, you'd figure he was teaching philosophy at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thing right now. Chuck Tanner says we've only got one more whack at him, boys, and we're just down a run. We can't let him go out any further. Jackson now will pitch to Rick Dempsey. Dempsey hitless. Fouls it back. Comes back to the screen. Not padded back there. And there's a microphone hanging down there. That's why it sounds like it's hitting the bottom of the barrel. Booming back. To Colby, when you look at him and you talked about, I've heard people say that they just don't believe that he has any muscles. Sometimes you look at the games that he's been in, he's been in 94. Sometimes you wonder, boy, he has really been some workhorse for this pirate staff. Probably doesn't have any muscles. That's why he had not had a sore arm or anything. He does a job. The Baltimore bullpen is quiet. Mike Planning has come to the on deck circle, so Earl Weaver is going to go with him in the top of the ninth inning, and Grant Jackson is outside to make the count one ball and one strike to Dempsey. There's Michael. This is the kind of ball game Weaver, you don't want to lose any kind, but never won when you build up a five run edge with your ace pitcher. Jackson pitching fine to Dempsey is inside with that one to make it two and one. Cocky badger might call them, but right now, <laughs> a little bit troubled. Well, right now he's just saying, let me get one more. Normally in a situation like this where you'd have a designated hitter, well, you'd probably see Dempsey bunning because the pitcher would not be hitting that. It's true. Excellent point. Pops him up. Moreno with his great speed comes gliding in to make the catch. One out. But that's the way it is this year with no DH in effect in this series. Next year they go back to the DH in effect. Alternating years. That's the check. The odd years right now they have no DH. The even years they go to the designated hitter. Look at Flanagan. He gets a standing ovation. 
Crowd of more than 53,000 up. You might see Flanagan, Buck. Might. This year, in a ballpark estimate, the winning team will probably get about $30,000 per person. The losing team, probably about $25,000 per person. Madlock certainly thinks he's going to bunt. He's going to shake hands with him. And he did offer the bunt. Well, Earl Weaver right here, he's just going to gamble left-hander to left-hander. He's going to gamble Bumbry against Jackson. That's all. If Flanagan can move his man. So I'll take that gamble with two outs. Look out. And that one got a piece bit Steve Nicosia. Did him hard. Dower was all the way around the third. He thought that might have been a wild pitch, but it just got a piece of the bat as Flanagan tried to move back out of the way. There it is. Boy, you think that doesn't hurt on a night like tonight. You know, I was wondering about this field, guys. I just, you know, we're not going to get any, any, uh, any help because it's going to freeze tonight or whatever so this field is not going to dry out overnight not much just have to hope for some sunshine tomorrow we may get a monsoon <laughs> there's a strike what was it Edward Bennett Williams said last night I asked him how he felt about the postponement and Ed said Louis Kuhn is a man of courage a man of steel who would call off a game in the face of a monsoon. <laughs> <laughs> One two pitch to Flanagan. He's gone. Strikes out. Big out. That is a big out. So Bumber will come now with two down and Dower at first base. Now here's where you go to your scouting book. Here's where you think about the move of Grant Jackson at first base. Even though you've got Bumbry at the plate, you know that Bumbry's going to have to hit one over somebody's head or up the alley somewhere. And Pittsburgh has got speed all over that outfield to try and score Dower from first base. You're liable to see Dower as he's just standing looking around at first base, seeing where his defense is. You're liable to see him take off, especially if Jackson does not have that real good move. Dower this season, though, had no particular record of running. Pitch is inside. He's not one of the faster birds. <laughs> but still, it is the unexpected move, if there is such a thing, with two teams that have studied each other as closely as these have. With two out. At the bottom of the eighth inning, a 5 4 ball game. Baltimore leading. Dower single. Broke the string of shutout innings by Pittsburgh relief pitching. They had blanked them since the second inning. Jackson's snapping slider is just low. Dower's taking a pretty safe lead at first base, and you've got a pretty good hole on that right side to hit through with Garner cheating a little bit over towards the bag at second base, and Scargill holding Dower at first. There's that hole. Hits it to the shortstop Foley. He goes to the second baseman Garner to get the force on the runner coming down. And after eight innings of play, the score, Baltimore five and Pittsburgh four. And here's the play that completed eight. As Foley played it well, looked it all the way into his glove, waited for Garner, and got the third out. Final chance for the Pirates coming up. Rich Dower stays to play second base for Baltimore in the top of the ninth inning. He had 17 errors at second base during the course of the season. There's your line score in the ball game for Pittsburgh. Tim Foley, Dave Parker, Bill Robinson, and Mike Flanagan on 126 pitches trying to go the distance. Pittsburgh this year, if you like to play the numbers game, won 25 ball games in the ninth inning. Well, you couldn't ask to have the cards stacked any better than what you have it right now. Here you've got the pesky little guy Foley trying to lead it off and get on base if he can. With Parker with three hits coming right. next. And Robinson, who by Flanagan's own admission in the interview that we did with him that you heard, saying that Robinson troubles him and always has. Now here is Foley. And Flanagan has a strike.
On the ground to the shortstop, Belanger. High throw, but Murray flags it down for out number one. Looked like that ball was going to sail for a second. Did at the start. This turned out to be a tight, tough ball game where it started out with the appearance of a rout. Excuse me, because of the five Baltimore runs in the first inning. Here's a man who can tie it up with one swing. And that's Mrs. Parker. Tie it up. Tie it up. Well, she's not the only Pirate fan open for that. And he's capable of tying it up, I'll guarantee you that. One swing could do it. But even as you talked about the Bucks winning 25 games in the ninth inning, the Birds have such a terribly remarkable statistic for holding on to a lead when they go into the ninth ahead. But they've been in a holding pattern. And what a game for the Bucks if they could win it at Baltimore against the ace. Ball is hit on the ground up the middle. Base hit for Dave Parker. It didn't take him long. So it's four hits for Dave Parker and a brilliant play in right center field on DeSensei to save a run. Look at this swing again. That just that short stride. Just pop and glide and that's it. Well, we'll have to put that on the first tee. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't think this man can hit it out. 24 home runs on the season. Stanhouse and Martinez. Martinez, the left-hander. Stanhouse, a right-hander. Oh, oh, they've oh, got oh. Parker picked off. He's safe. Parker goes barreling into second base, and he clobbers Belanger, and the ball is apparently loose, and Belanger is down. I tell you, he went in hard, and he just actually forced that air. He went in, he talked about an 89-foot slide, and that's exactly what happened. They have him dead to rights right here. Yes, now Murray did. can't get it out of the that's club, That's the problem. That's what I want to call attention to. You're seeing Parker go down, and he was almost down there by the time the ball passed him, and that was the problem. Had Murray made the throw promptly, it would have been no contest. Here's Murray. Now they got him. Now he double clutches a little bit. Notice. He reaches in. And look how long it takes for that ball to get there. But look at this slide by Parker. And he is right on Belanger's glove. And he just kicks it out. And who does that remind you? Look at it pop in the air. Good camera that work. What does that remind you of? Yes, Stanky sir. and Rizzuto. That's right. Back in 1951 when Eddie Stanky kicked it out of the Scooter's glove. There it is. Yeah, but he's out. That's a good angle. He was Belanger out. Can hang on. The play became needlessly close, as Don pointed out, because of the lateness of the Murray throw. And Belanger stays. He's all right. You give credit to the second base umpire. That is Russ Getz. He was right on top of that play. Charge Belanger with an error. Each team now with three errors in the ball game. The tying run at second base. One out. Robinson, your batter. That was a great move by Flanagan. He had him dead to rights. And you know, he really hadn't gone over there all night long with any serious move at all. Well, he got eight this year. He's really worked on that. Now the pitch to Robinson. And Bill, got to be, oh, the adrenaline is just the thumpity thump. Earl Weaver, a manager who's not afraid of the second guess, staying still with his ace. Willie Stargell is on deck. Pitch blocked. It's in the dirt. Dempsey comes up with it. Well, the thing right here, Weaver is not sitting in the good position. If he goes out to make the move to bring the right-hander in, he knows That's one right. thing. Tanner's sitting over there with John Miller on the bench, too, or Mike Easler. And he odd. He's got a bunch of left-handers over there just waiting in the wings. Good pitch. Flanagan now 131 pitches. That's a long night's work. I tell you, this little guy here, he's showing you some a little fortitude out there tonight. Well, especially when he had Robinson uh, Parker picked off and he thought that would be it. Up. Cued to the second baseman, Dower. Two down. Parker at third. So it comes down to this. 
the big man who homered in his last time at bat to open the eighth inning to make it a one-run ball game. A man who many think will be the MVP in the National League. Fans on their feet waiting for out number three. They'll watch it standing up. Willie Stargell on playing in the series says, quote, getting into the World Series is like savoring a fine meal. It's something you take slowly and enjoy every minute. It's the best of seven feasts. Inside ball one. There is one of the few times that Stargell's had a fastball tonight. He's seen a lot of breaking pitches hit his home run off a breaking pitch. That could be just to put something in the mind of Stargell. That came on a pitch. But Dempsey wanted it over the top. And Flanagan didn't put it there. Strike. One and one. This man can do to a low ball, Don, and you know it what Reggie Jackson can do to a low ball. Golf it right out of the ballpark. Oh, he's an excellent low ball hitter. He'll hit it nine miles. He won't just get it out of the ballpark. He might have hit it clean over everything. There you get the deuce, get the change. Look out. Low. Oh, oh. I'll tell you that Dempsey's put in a night's work. This is what we meant when he said he was so great back there. The Baltimore infield way back. Coming inside. High pop left side. Belanger going out. Makes the catch. Baltimore wins it. Five four. What a tough victory, and what an augury for this World Series. Each team playing according to its pattern of the year. It's really incredible when you look at it. Baltimore holding together with its pitching ace all the way. And the Bucks chopping, 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 getting the great relief pitching just fell. Well, you really can't say enough, I don't think, for the gutty performance of Mike Flanagan. He stayed right there. He fought him to the nail, and he ends up on top. The line score, Baltimore 5-6-3, Pittsburgh 4-11-3, back after this message and a word from our local station.